Hey, we're live. Nice. What's up? I couldn't hey. help to notice that I could hear birds chirping, and it sounds very like nature. I think it's Marcus's <laughs> background. Marcus, yeah, it, it is. It almost looks like it almost looks like Marcus has a fake background, though. <laughs> <laughs> it just like it just looks like one of those like because it's so still. That from photo booths. Yeah, yeah, it almost yeah. looks like that. <laughs> Yeah, it's it a is. breach. In, it's a breach in uh, in our style, man. So. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna put a, some crazy studio in the background? No, actually yeah. not. <laughs> not today. <laughs> so, are you um, are you just hanging out there, or are you field recording? Uh, right now, hanging out. Uh, okay. But yeah, sometimes I go field recording here. Yeah, I just got a new one yesterday. So, a new field recorder. Yeah. yeah. What'd you get? Uh, Tescam DX40D, is it yeah. that way around? Yeah, I think I so. Yeah. Look that up. It's the same Chris is using. Chris leaving. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I have one of those like Zoom H6s that is pretty useful, but I've always been interested in those sound devices. They're, they're rather expensive though. Yeah. I don't even know it's... if I need that much. <laughs> What did she record? Did she get anything uh, anything good? Well, yesterday I, I didn't record like uh, outside. I just recorded uh, the Lyra 8 stuff. I just ah, okay. played, played around on that, yeah. Because I don't have a sound card uh, with me at the moment. So I just record on the field recorder and transfer it on the laptop then. So. Okay, but you mean you you use the the mics to record it? Did you did you amp it no, and no, record per, it? No, oh, no, okay. per per line in, yeah. Ah, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Are you away from your studio, or do you just in general don't have a sound card right now? Um, I'm away from my studio. Um, okay. yeah. the The idea was to move last weekend to the to a new place, mm -hmm. uh, new house, and um, so I. The idea was also to set up a studio there, but that's postponed to next month. So, yeah. So everything is uh, in boxes right now. Just uh, uh, the, the stuff I want to play around with at the moment, I take out and yeah. I was going to say, making any music how at impressive all that... would that be that you make the music that you do without a sound card? <laughs> no, no, I have. I have. <laughs> 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 Sorry, David. Didn't mean to interrupt you. What were you saying? No, I just said if he, if he's still at least working on any music, like on your laptop or something. Yeah, I do. A lot yeah. of sketches. Yeah, doing a lot of sketches and the final stuff I always do in in a proper space. So nice. yeah. right now it's just like collecting ideas. Yeah. <coughs> do you find yourself to be productive on a laptop, like outside of your normal studio setup? It was hard. Yeah. Um, like two years ago, I I was kind of forced to uh, do it on a laptop because my studio was um, far away, yeah, and I wasn't able to go there like every day. So I just got a new Mac, and um, yeah, I forced myself to get into it and doing it on the laptop, and I just got a, a big Dropbox, uh, so I think it with that okay. so everything is on the on the dropbox so yeah that makes sense because when i when i first got back to the us like right when the lockdown began which was like the beginning of march i i spent two weeks in quarantine before i like reintegrated with my family yeah and all i had was my laptop and i just could not get into making music the same there as i do in my studio yeah Me well too. It's like the, uh, the times I spent in Berlin for weeks, you know, and Luis has his own studio, but he's always doing stuff. And I'll just try to sit in the living room in the kitchen. And I don't know, man, just like always just being on the little pet trackpad and doing stuff. It just like, yeah, uh, I can't get into to, it. To be honest, I uh, have the machine micro to, uh, to have at least some, some, some buttons, some, some buttons. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah, that's awesome. I think we discussed this last week as well. You know uh, how how people use the laptop, and some people can get uh, you know full productions done on yeah. on a laptop. Uh, I can't. I, I can't I produce admire on that the plane. Because, no, no, same. Yeah, I th yeah. I think with Steffi, we discussed it with Steffi. Yes, 
Um, anyway, but um, uh, you can. I find myself always being able to do a part of the process, though. You know, mm. it's not like you you finish an entire piece of music yeah. or a track, but you can still, you know, fuck around with uh, you know some plugin or you know even with stuff you you know mic into the into the laptop and you know loop around or put like chains of effects behind or you know just general you know uh general just uh, uh experimentation basically and uh, yeah. or or maybe just do it do edits of something you know if you have an hour recording of some something you can sort of you know narrow that narrow it down and that's kind of those are the little jobs you can get done in in hotel rooms yeah. or yeah uh, but yeah like do entire productions when you don't have your uh, familiar tools is very yeah. very hard. <laughs> it is. But I'm al I'm always doing like DJ edits too of tracks, like putting kick drums under old old uh, vinyl rips and stuff like that too. So I like mm. doing that as well, making yeah. my my own DJ friendly version of tracks as well. <laughs> yeah, when I did my my last album, I do recall I spent a lot of time on trains and I basically just had reactor open and standalone, not even in a DAW. And I would just hit the the built-in recorder on Reactor and just play with patches and just record like fifteen minute stems. And I integrated a lot of those stems into the album. Mm. So I, I think I, I when I'm on the road and I don't have my laptop, I tend to use. I mean, I don't have my main studio computer. I use my laptop more to just create sound libraries to work mm. with later in the studio. Yeah, making loops and stuff. I have loads yeah. of that actually. Just making tons of loops and and just end up with this crazy library of stuff that I almost never touch. <laughs> Maybe put out a sample pack. <laughs> yeah, this is the time, man. Yeah, yeah make yeah, some sure. money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and share some sounds. <laughs> and share exactly. Yeah. Like in the beginning, in the beginning of the quarantine, it was like uh, you know you guys know Kyle Geiger, right? Yeah. 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 He was doing. Um, he was doing. Well, he's still doing them. He's doing these twist streams of like music production kind of free classes and stuff and we like a bunch of artists contributed to this big sample pack of sounds that he has i think it's still up for free somewhere on a dropbox and just like kick drums loops you know synth synth loops and stuff like that so i had a bunch of stuff that i was sitting on that i gave him to to give away so now it's like oh you know i used to make sample packs like 10 years ago but like i'm not under my name just like generic kind of sweep sounds or sound effects. Techno and, Loops Volume 1. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Because like, this was like, before I really started touring. So I didn't really, I wasn't making enough money to off of gigs. It was like 12 years ago. And uh, yeah, I started making sample packs for, for Lenny D, you know, Industrial Strength mm, Records. Yeah. He, he runs a sample pack company. And he's still going and he's just like man make sample packs you can make some extra cash so i was doing that and then after i started gigging and you know money started coming in so i didn't really have to do that anymore and now it's like oh there's no gigs so maybe it's time to start making sound packs. <laughs> return to the sample packs yeah yeah you know go back to your roots go back to my roots <laughs> well if you do it on the i mean if you've never done it on your under your real name if you would do that now i'm sure that would be Tons of people wanting to uh, check out your um, your library, you know. Yeah, so that's that's out. kind of the idea now. Maybe we can like... get some encouragement from the people in the, in the chat in the YouTube chat. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's what's up, there's, people. <laughs> there's, but there's so many producers I've noticed. Like, I, I guess maybe like the pro producers or kind of the more geeky ones that they hate using sample packs or they talk crap on people who use sample packs. You know what I mean? So I don't know what kind of uh, audience you have. <laughs> if they're more the, you know, purist. That's, an, that's actually an interesting audience. topic because I think if you're creating sample libraries or sample packs that that can be useful as tools, it's one thing. But uh, uh, the problem is that most sample libraries are just kind of created as cheats, where there are these yeah, loops yeah. that you can drag and drop into a sequence and be able to do stuff, but. Um, yeah, it's I like mean, paint, painting by numbers, you know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, um, <laughs> hit this but, key and be yeah, be done with it. But like, for instance, like what what was that uh, that nine oh nine drum library that that a lot of people use? What's gold baby. The gold baby with like the tape saturation stuff on it. I mean, that stuff is incredibly useful to use. I use the shit out of those. Yeah. <laughs> 
used to. I have a real Lantern 9 now, luckily. <laughs> but before, that's what I was using. I was using those. They sounded they sounded dirty and raw and, like, just really, really well put together, you know? It's like every little knob turn was recorded. And it's like this huge, you know, you'd have, like, 100 kick drums of just the uh, from a few knob turns, you know? And then, then it's, like, one that's run through a tape saturator, one that's just straight raw and... So those those came in handy. But like, you know, I, I haven't been producing for a super long time. So I remember in like 2000, maybe like 2005 or four, when, when basically people were sharing sample packs and like you could, you, there was always like these certain packs that you can, you can hear the sounds used in tracks. And now I think there's just so many that it, you, it'd probably be impossible to really point out like, oh, this is from this pack, unless you made mm -hmm. it yourself. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like back in the day, back in the day, I remember hearing loops and and sound effects. So I'm like, I have that, and like someone mm -hmm. someone just kind of threw it on top and didn't really mess with it, and it's just like the raw sound, like those vengeance yeah. sound libraries. Yeah, that's that, those were the ones vengeance pack <laughs> that everybody used. <laughs> You hear like so many of those loops and sound effects and kick drums is like all the same. But, yeah, yeah, I think I think there's nothing. I don't have anything against uh, against it as long as it's uh, like Mo said, uh, uh, used as a tool. You know, as a, as a sound source. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, once once you get into the territory where it's actually painting by numbers and you know, the uh, just stacking some loops that you found on a in a pack. You know that. It's not. I mean, I don't care if people actually do that, you know, or get away with even get away with it. But it's it's just not fun, you know. It's just a fucking yeah, yeah. boring way of getting things done. Yeah, get I mean, the, the, the whole the whole fun, the whole fun is in uh, you know getting uh, you know to the to the point where you want to uh, want to go or you know uh, or yeah, you know, just something um, that sounds good to your ears instead of um, um, something you just find, you know. But uh, well, yeah, interesting. I, it's interesting to see people want to always cheat the creative process just to in, in to achieve like instant results of popularity or fame. Or do people do? I mean, do you really do you really find that people do? I think there is a certain group so. or a certain a super a certain type of people that do. I don't think everybody does. I don't think a lot of people in our field does much. But you find that a lot in pop music and even um, in more mainstream forms of music where it's not necessarily about the creative process of creating music, but it's more about creating a product to put on a shelf in mm. order to have something to market to and promote. Push. Yeah. yeah. Well, you fair enough. I mean? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, who are we to criticize at the end of the day? It's, it's easy to like shake your fist at everybody in the world, but um, I think <laughs> people like us tend to cherish that creative process. And when we listen to music, we also tend to find inspiration in people who put all their effort in that creative process. So mm. we put it on a pedestal, of course. Why wouldn't we? True. Yeah. What, what about, but like, but then at that, okay, so you have, you have these pre-made sample libraries that people would use. What about like VSTs that make your tracks instantly sound better without having to do anything to it? Like what? Ah, what's the, what's that one? Uh, ozone or something like that. Like you can just slap an ozone on your master, like have a really shitty mix. And all of a sudden your track, and all of a sudden your tracks is like all gelled together and it sounds great. So there's well, people it sounds, it sounds, I don't know, I don't know if it's, uh, you know, I always said it's, it's when it's shit in, it's gonna be shit out, you know, no matter how many plugins you stack onto it and make it sound impressive. You can make sound, make things sound impressive, but not actually really, really good, you know. If it's um, no matter how many ozones you stack onto, yeah, uh, a, a crappy sounding track. It's gonna sound like it's punchier and it's it has more dynamics and stuff, you know. Or it has it's more impressive. It's like it's got big fat outlines, you know what I mean? Yeah. But it's still not good, <laughs> you know what right. I mean? But I'm, that's 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 the point. It's like you have these people that that just want to crank out tracks and they they mm -hmm. haven't really learned how to mix well yet, and then mm -hmm. they'll throw the ozone and then they have like the waves one knob thing where you just literally just put it on something, you turn it up, and all of a sudden it's like. Oh, this sounds great. Which all it's doing is adding some bass and like some top end, you know. Mm -hmm. And then they're just like, "All right, done." And like, "All right, this track's finished, and let's move on to the next one." You no, know? it's cool. Whatever works, man. If if yeah. if that's what you want, it's fine. 
Yeah. Uh, I think it's more fun to uh, to arrive there, um, you know, by finding out how it actually works, or you know, exactly. yeah. finding your own uh, taste in in the whole uh, range of possibilities, basically. Yeah, and that's kind of like how that's how I learned just from listening to records, man. Just like listening to records that I liked and how they sound and. Like when I was learning how to mix, there wasn't a YouTube tutorials, you know, it was like yeah. you had to figure out how to compress something or how they they made something sound wide. And, and I just had to figure out myself, you know. Yeah, nowadays it's like tutorials for everything. I was like, how do I, how do I EQ vocals in a, punch yeah. track or a techno track and this stuff? And just like everything is there, which is great, you know, and because th then you learn how to do it yourself. But I don't know. Maybe. Yeah, isn't it what it's all about? I mean, the the. Uh, of course, it's a lot of uh, help. That's that's yeah. pretty nice. I I mm. wish that that would have been like uh, accessible back when I started music yeah, that's, uh, doing that's music. That's what I was gonna say. <laughs> you know, um, but yeah, in the end, of course, it took me a longer time to get there, uh, where I'm now. But um, you also have your own way of of doing things you know like sure yeah i yeah, I've, like, I've recently found it incredibly inspiring how much information is on youtube i mean even yeah. like when i'm working on the euro rack modular system there might be like a module that has a bunch of inputs in it that i don't even really know what it does and then it's always <laughs> i've just recently discovered it i mean i know it's existed for a while but i think i've finally put it at my fingertips to be able to go to youtube and just like search that one module and learn each one of those individual functions and getting information right away is, has been incredibly helpful. And I can imagine it's just going to get better. Yeah. But that's a practical tutorial. That's not people send, uh, telling you how to do something yeah. or not, not, uh, you know, how to use something, but you know, just laying out the possibilities, Features just laying out. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. In that sense, it's very useful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Joachim, do you ever find yourself, like not knowing how to do something and going on YouTube and looking it up. I don't. I don't mind if I don't know how how, how something you works. Mind. You know. Yeah. You figure. No, it out. I mean, I mean, I usually I do, but uh, usually I do know how it works. But uh, if if there is, for example, something in a module that I don't really quite understand, or not even a module, but any piece of gear, um, might be a plugin. Um, I'll, you know, I'll still I'll still decide whether to use it or not based on what it sounds like. You know, mm -hmm. just use your ears and see what it does for you. If it if it makes sense or if it does something which you like well, that you like, it's um, it's it's as valid a reason to use it. You know, even if you don't know how it how it worked. You yeah. know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. That's generally how I do it. It's like I'll uh, for like practical reasons I'll go on YouTube to look stuff up, but like. I'll turn a knob and do something until I hear something that I like. Yeah, I don't. Really, I don't really understand what it's really doing. Yeah, well, it's, that's totally it's legit, isn't it? I mean, I mean, <laughs> yeah, true. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like if someone were, if like if I had to explain to someone what it's doing, I'd be like, I don't know, but it, this is what I, it sounds great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like for instance, just recently after I had that discussion I had with you, Joachim, about about send effects and having an auxiliary send on your return channel for effects. I was trying to figure out how I could do that internally inside of Bitwig. And after doing some research like on Discord um, servers and stuff, it seems that it's impossible to do. I'm not even sure if it's possible to do it in Ableton internally on a computer, but somebody was telling me, oh, well, of course it's possible. It? Maybe it is on Ableton, but you can't do it on Bitwig. Okay. Okay. Really? So somebody, yeah. Somebody on Bitwig was telling me use a DC offset. And I'm like, what the fuck is a DC offset? I've never used a DC offset in music. Are we are we really talking about the same thing? Because the the all all it is is basically put your uh, return uh, channels, which are normally, you know, in in DAWs, the return channels are just uh, audio inputs Auto with channel. with with no EQ and uh, and the sends are usually deactivated. In Ableton, exactly. you can you can activate the sends, so you can uh, you know send something from the effect return to some other bus or to itself, you know, which is the, the yeah, thing. Exactly. And, then, and then you just use EQ um, uh, on the on the track where the send is coming from or where, where it's returning to, to, you know, fuck around with uh, creating feedback loops and stuff. Yeah, um, absolutely. It must be That's possible in every door as long as you can uh, send it back to, uh, you know. And back into a channel. Not into itself, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, it, from all the research that I've done, because I've tried it continuously, and we are we are talking about the exact same thing. Right. Okay. It seems like it's a feature a feature in Bitwig that they've disabled for safety reasons. Because if people create feedback loops, maybe they'll blow out their speakers or something like that. So even creating like an effect return on a regular channel and then turning up the send, you get no feedback loop. Mm. So Oh, so, okay, okay, right. You know what I mean? Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's just a safety thing. Well, you should be able to. I think that they dealt, in Ableton, they dealt with it by deactivating the sends on the return channels. So okay. only people who actually deliberately want to activate them, uh, they... I suppose they know what they're doing. They know what they're yeah. doing, you know. I guess I got to go back to Ableton again. And <laughs> Just for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, or, do, or do it analog, man. In, in your Eurorack system, it'll be possible somewhere, you yeah. know. No, I do that quite a bit. On my, I have a little, like, a 16-channel mixing console here with, like, two aux sends, and I do it a lot. No, there you reverbs. go. But uh, I was just trying to do it inside the box for, this, for, okay. the, sake, for the sake of testing it and... I was unsuccessful. Unfortunately. Okay. It's more fun to do it analog as well because yeah. you have much more feeling with uh, where the the point is where it starts to, you know, get out of control or break up. Um, it requires very, very, very uh, uh, tight and you know, uh, how do you say that? Like very uh, minute. Meticulous control. Yeah, my meticulous control. Exactly. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, but it's yeah, it should be possible in in um, in Ableton. But um, analog is more fun, I guess, for this particular thing. Yeah. Try it with your uh, Eurorack, man. I've, yeah, we'll do. Yeah. Hey, Yoko, what desk is that in the back? What's your mixing desk? Um, it's uh, I've, it's. I've a, never really seen your studio. <laughs> okay, uh, it's a it's a DDA uh, mixing desk. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, I can show you the studio a little bit better like this. Amazing. Some mixing stuff. And is my uh, Eurorack stuff. Nice. Oh, I would I would I would pin you for to have a lot more modular stuff, but that's good. That you you didn't get too crazy. <laughs> um well, did you have did you have more like there's a lot more over there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's I, some. I was uh, expecting to see this giant wall of like. No, I, I mean, no, I mean, it's, it's, it's endless, you know. Before you know it, and and I'm I'm, in it because I don't I don't I'm I'm not a collector, you know. I'm just I just want to have the useful stuff. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, once it becomes too Frankenstein, it becomes daunting and and. Uh, <laughs> less productive and i'd like to stay productive with it yeah but i mean if you can see it in the some of them are uh, these smaller um units they're, they're like these roland boxes with just one just one row of um uh, okay. modules yeah. and um they can be on its uh, on on the they, you can put them flat down and you can tilt them so they stay like in an angle like this um and you can stack them and they are basically all they all have different functions so you know two of them are dedicated to sequ sequencing one one to drum sounds one to effects uh one to oscillators and control things so i can put them on the around the studio so i've got a couple of ones they're lying on the table at the moment um just acting as a, a small little unit a skiff you know for effects or for control stuff yeah. so it's like a modular modular synth you know yeah, it's uh, it's not it's not on a wall or in one position. It's like the different instruments with different functions floating around the studio for different things. Yeah. So you just take like one row to the yeah. middle. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Or it's part of the of the bigger setup. Or but I can I can move it around. That's the point. You know, once yeah. you start building a wall, it's it's fixed. You know, and you keep yeah, changing yeah. changing modules, and the position of modules becomes unclear at some point because you think, okay, this function. Uh, should be in this row and blah. I don't know. People come up with all kinds of uh, ways to, uh, you know, find a, find a logical order to their modules. But um, yeah. once it becomes too big, you keep fucking, you know, screwing and unscrewing things. And I, I just make dedicated skips, basically, um, which perform one function and then, then take them around the studio. Yeah. Okay. When did you get into the modular stuff? Uh, about me? Yeah. 
about seven or eight years ago, I think. Okay. When just just when when it became something not exclusively Dupfer, but also uh, make noise and Intelligel were just start, start yeah, tip top were starting. Yeah, yeah that's the, around that time. Um, Did you yeah. ever have any of the like early modular stuff before Eurorack really blew up, like back in the days? You mean like uh, classic module modulars? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or do you still have any? <laughs> yeah, I still have the 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 system one hundred. Oh, okay. Nice. The complete one with the with the sequencer and the mixer and the speakers. Oh, um, I've got the ARP twenty six hundred still. All right. Um, yeah. And what else? Yeah, the the EMS synthy. I count that as a modular thing as well. Because it's got CV inputs on the oscillators. It's a little mod. I have um, the BSP. <laughs> let me see what else. Um, <laughs> Are two really? Yeah, I mean, I it's mean, like handy. <laughs> I think like the things like the um, uh, Sherman filter are really modular as well, yeah. you know, because um, I mean, it depends on how we, how you set things up, but um, uh, I've always dealt with most of the stuff that's in my studio as a modular uh, thing, you know, yeah. Be before right now, this is all uh, sort of disassembled and I built setups for each pro project. But before I had everything patch bayed, you know, so it's I had a massive patch bay and it was still completely modular. I could, you know, use any audio input of any synth uh, into any app pedal or effects processor or any compressor yeah. or whatever. So basically, yeah, yeah, it's it, it was a modular way of working, too. That's how I've, how I've always preferred to work, you know, building chains of stuff and, you know, be able to get very um, deep sound design things very quickly because yeah. you build a dedicated chain of something. Sure. Um, so, but that's nice yeah. because you change uh, the setup all the time. You stay like, yeah. Uh, yeah, OK, what can I do with this combination? And that's pretty nice. I'm really looking forward to set up the new studio because I will set it up like totally different like the last one, you know, like it's always something new to discover then. Yeah, exactly. And it's and it's quick, too, because you, you make a decision about uh, about your system of the day or your system of yeah. the week. And you think, OK, what happens if I put this behind this through this and, you know, and and you start it's it's a limit it's it's limited but it's still very flexible because you have multiple pieces of gear that interact with each other in different ways and you know yeah. um, and you never really know what's going to happen although you have an idea uh, and then you start working with it and and you know playing around with it and because it's limited uh, you always get results because you are dedicated to this small setup and it's yeah. you know how it works Absolutely. you set it you just set it up you don't have to think about it um easy yeah and it's quick you know quick and Quick results. Yeah, that's nice what idea. I like. <laughs> that's why I stopped with modular. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Did you did you um, yeah, did you yeah. use modular? Did you did you sell it or did you? Uh, I sold like everything. Um, I just kept the uh, Metasonic's reverb. Okay. Uh, thing. Um, was that a conscious? I... Was that a conscious thing? So like I I'm quitting with this. This is not for me. Yeah. The hell with absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. Really? I started I started with it like with. Yeah, yeah, and five five years ago or something. And I, I think I bought like too much stuff at the same time, uh, and I just didn't get the results I I had in mind. And I really need like quick results when I'm in the studio. Like normally when I produce music, I have to have something within an hour and then work on it like for maybe a few more hours and then stop. You know, like otherwise, I I don't like it anymore, or I I really get bored, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. If it doesn't work for you, don't force it. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So I decided to sell everything. Like. Yeah. yeah. My my modular little setup here is never expanded. It's like it's just little two little two rows, and it just it does what I needed to do. I never had yeah. to buy any more you know what yeah. i mean i've had the same setup for man i don't know maybe like five years now what's and in there it's uh oops my screensaver came on <laughs> okay <laughs> One second. why isn't it oh crap there you go sorry 
Um, <laughs> I got like a Z3000. I have the braids. I got rings. I got the herb verb. Uh, the um, Pittsburgh delay. Um, verbose amplitude tone, tone controller. I got a Pittsburgh filter. Uh, intelligent the, dual ASR. I mean, I could just show it. The herb verb is the one with the mud inside, right? Yeah, it's a make noise one that Tom. Yeah, Tom yeah, it's simple. It's the, sound, the sound head guy, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I sequence it with the Moskva, and I also have the Beat Step Pro by Arturia, so I can sync it with my Ableton and stuff. So uh, nothing. I mean, it's it's, it's speaks, not complex. It speaks volumes to the simplicity of music too, because, I mean, with the very yeah, my music is sounds, not complex at all it does and, and by by all means it doesn't need to be because it's it's effective yeah. <laughs> so it's that's like, i mean that's that's, still the, bangs, so. that's the type of music i i like to make anyway I, I never got into crazy experimental soundscapes and like you know i i just never got never got deep into that stuff while i i appreciate listening to it and the people who make it but for me personally i just like to make some club bangers, you know? <laughs> yeah, but well, I mean, it, it's funny that you say that because, um, of course, yeah, your, your music is extremely effective and, and extremely, uh, uh, there's a lot of it as well, you know? You, you just crunch them out, you know, <laughs> yeah, at a crazy rate, you know? But but there is, the, I mean, even though they're all effective, doesn't mean that they're all the same. So there's always a uh, very clear aesthetic to each each track you do, you're doing. Yeah, and obviously also quite a bit of sound design. Yeah, um, yeah. you know it's not like just a, a bunch of samples you found or, you know. So so there is a lot of actual, um, you know, your There's your input. Thought. Your yeah 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 absolutely yeah yeah. So I mean, although the music that comes out of it is effective, it's still very uh, very um, skilled uh, process. Yeah, yeah. I think I mean I'd like to think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure, man. <laughs> it works in the club so yeah. that's i don't know that's that's the kind of that's the music i grew up listening to mostly was kind of club techno more than more of the banging stuff well i but, mean not only just like straight banging but i mean this speaks to marcus and and david as well i mean you guys have this incredible um skill for creating grooves mm, that just like yeah. you that you could just feel the swing and everything it just the whole feeling of the track has the right vibe. And that's the thing. It's like, it's feeling, you know, when you have people yeah. ask me like, how do you get this? How do you get this groove in your tracks? I'm just like, I, I don't even know. It just, <laughs> it comes out. That's how it comes out. I don't know how to explain it. You know, sometimes, yeah. yeah, I can explain the technical part of like how I, how I sequence hi hats and stuff like that. But in the end, it's, it's where each sound is placed in the sequence. And I, so for me, a lot of times it just naturally occurs that way. Mm. I'm not. I'm not really trying to achieve that every time. It just happens because of yeah. where I place each sound. Even though it's a, it, it could be a totally different sound, but the way they work and sound together in the end, it's just like it's got this groove to it. And they're like, "How do you do that?" And I was like, "I, I don't know. I just I put this how I lay it down, and that's what comes out, and that's when it sounds good to me." You when know? you place when you play sounds, do you actually draw things on a grid, or or do you play it? in with drum machines or keys or whatever so like with my modular that sequence with the beat step pro which is just syn oh, yeah. synced with ableton but like um like i have a profit six and uh sub 37 which i use a lot as well and those actually draw into uh um, mm. the pattern on ableton but i don't know i just like using the onboard sequencer it doesn't give me as much control as i would like you know what I mean? I like to be able to, to move the notes and change okay, yeah. notes velocity instead of having to just do jam out on it. You know what I mean? Like I just like to have control of everything as much as possible. Mm. That's how I like. Same with the 909. Like I never use the 909 sequencer. No, nope. like, you're crazy. No, I like drawing it in into the into the sequencer and then just moving the each note around and mm. messing the good with thing velocities. The good thing is that you can recall everything. That too. And all yeah. the notes are there, everything's there, you know. But you yeah. know, some people tell me I'm crazy for not using it, but I just I prefer to make my own swing, my own mm. my own way instead of the preset way that's in the nine oh nine, you know what I mean? Yeah. 
because I can move one note further than the next one instead of having to shift the whole grid over. That's true. Yeah. So yeah. I, I just like working that way. Yeah. Yeah. And I recently hooked up my 909 to have its own uh, separate outputs, which I didn't for the longest. It was, it was ah, okay. Everything was <laughs> mono. And I would just record each sound. I would make a pass and record each sound separately so I can mix it down properly, you know? But now I have I have finally hooked it up and it's so much better and way less time consuming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's funny. You, you still wife. work with uh, with uh, Fruity Loops? No, I stopped using Fruity Loops years ago. Okay. Once I once I started getting more hardware, Fruity Loops was so bad to work with hardware. Yeah. And Ableton Ableton was like just the way to go for me. So yeah, I mean, I still yeah, because have because I remember uh, I saw a picture of you using it, and I was like, okay, nice. Yeah, I mean, the first I don't know eight or nine the first like eight years of like all the truncate records i put out almost everything yeah. was all through fruity loops and it was like all vsts i mean mm -hmm. i didn't i didn't really have any hardware i never i could okay. never afford it yeah of course like everyone who starts doing music yeah uh, like, honestly yeah. though there was nothing that i loved more than hearing conversations from people who were admiring david's music and saying like Oh my God, man! Like, what do you use to make your track? <laughs> you must be using all this outboard gear to process. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, man, I just do it in FL Studio. Yeah. Their mouth would just drop. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've had people tell me there's, there's like, there's no way that sound is coming out of Fruit Loops. I'm like, well, why would I lie about that? It's yeah. like, like, no, you're, you're probably exporting it and like mixing in Pro Tools. I was like, no, dude, I never even own Pro Tools. I'm like, everything is done in the box. On uh, the FL Studio, that's it. And like, no, man, uh, you're you're lying. It's like, no, just more proof. It, it's not. It's not really about what you're using. It's just how you use it. Yeah. yeah. Well, especially if you spend um, eight years in in the same program, you you yeah. you by yeah. then by the by that time you you know how to work every little thing to to get the one the thing you want. You know. Well, you exactly. better you yeah. better know it well. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> if not, we got a whole other problem that we got to deal with. And and it's the the thing you were talking about earlier with the auxiliary feedback loops and stuff. See, that's that was another thing I liked about free loops is that you can route anything to anywhere on that mm. mixer, and mm. that's what was another thing that I really enjoyed about it. I, I mean, I could have I could have a group and then even route that group to like each sound separately to other groups, and then there's mix knobs on there, and you'd get these crazy sounding drums sometimes. And uh, yeah. you can't, I mean, I've never really tried that in Ableton. I don't know if you can go that far in Ableton of like routing groups to other groups. It probably wouldn't even, it, I don't even think it's a practical thing, but it gave some interesting sounds. I you think can. it's, you can. Able, you can. Yeah, 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 you can. I've never really got that deep in Ableton because I, I mean, it does what I, what I want it to do and I need it to do at this point. So no crazy routing for me. But I, know, I just remember when, when Mo switched over to uh, to Bitwig because of Luis, it was because of the he basically the the big selling point was the routing. That's or the modulation or something. Like that. Yeah. Okay. Modulation capabilities. Yeah. But what's your process mostly, Marcus, in the studio? Are you using but mostly Ableton? Uh, Ableton is my uh, door, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, for for drums, I just play the TR8. Um, but I don't sync it. I just sync it by ear, so it's not connected with yeah. MIDI and stuff. Really? Yeah. Maybe that's, that's one surprising. of the secrets. That's surprising. <laughs> oh, you mean you you play the the buttons? You you live drum? No, on no. The, the I I I, I, I um, tempo and just hit play. Exactly. Yeah, and then sync it by ear, and then you have like directly small variations oh no shit okay. and um i also put the swing around 33 or something mm. so yeah yeah and then yeah i i would say i take the best out of the out of both worlds you know like you mean uh, hardware and and software yeah yeah, yeah, yeah of sure. course okay i have uh, a lot of outboard effects uh, well not a lot but a few things which I really like, like DP4+, plus, uh, Sherman filter bank, stuff like that, effect pedals, um, and process sounds through that. So that's pretty fun. Hmm. Yeah. And you, 
So do you, do you sorry, do you mix uh, in the box then as a last stage or? Uh, sometimes do you... I do, but sometimes I also do it uh, with my external mixer. Right. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Depends how how I want to have it, you know, like, yeah. But as I said before, uh, the good thing about doing everything in the box is you can recall everything. Mm. So if I have set up everything on the on the external mixer and changed something because I'm working on another track, I'm fucked, you know. Yeah. Just take a photo, but it's not exactly the same. Yeah, it's impossible to get mm. exactly to the same point. So, yeah, most of the time it's in the box. Do you use your DP4 Plus a lot, or is it just kind of every once in a while you? Uh, for for reverb on on hi hats and shakers, I use it a lot. Yeah, I have one, and I have just never really utilized it that much. Yeah. Oh, it's uh, it's been overlooked for uh, for the longest time, but it's getting back into the favorite people's favorites list now. The DP4. Yeah. yeah. It's becoming um, too expensive, to be honest. I mean, when you really. Can, Oh yeah, when you could buy I got it for mine a couple for, of hundred. for two hundred. Exactly, or but yeah, but yeah. now it's uh, you know six seven hundred now. Lucky me. <laughs> yeah, it's com becoming. You know, it's one of these things that uh, coming back into fashion, I guess. It's funny, is I I originally had a DP four, and uh, Houghton hit me up and asked me if I wanted to trade him my DP four for DP four plus, <laughs> and I was like thinking. Why am I getting an upgrade? <laughs> What's he, what does he know that I don't? <laughs> so it just didn't make any sense to me. But at the end of the day, I was like, yeah, fuck it. Let's do it. So I traded it. And I'm still not clear today if I got the short end of the stick or he got the better one. <laughs> okay. What does the plus have that the other one doesn't? Um, to be frankly, know. honestly, I think, I think it has CV ins and outs. But maybe the original one had CV ins and outs too. Um, but the configuration processing is more modular in terms of because you have four groups the A, B, C, and D group and you can switch them around in, in different orientations hmm. I, to be honest I don't know what the difference is but um, I, yeah I've, I've had one for years I toured with it even Okay. Bulk, bulky machine to tour with but yeah <laughs> it was the, the best one uh, to go with at that, at that time the phaser is uh, Pretty special in. Uh, I'm not a big phaser guy, but the phaser in the DP4 is uh, is pretty cool. I think. Hey, Joachim, did you ever or have you recently done any like live gigs, or was it all has it all been just DJ? Uh, well, yeah, hybrid. You know, so I I've, I use Tractor for the for most of the gigs uh, as a looper. You know, as a sampler mm -hmm. right, basically, and then I I bring. Um, um, Sometimes I bring my 909 and some effects, you know, um, and uh, yeah, so it's not really like a full live show like I used to do in the, uh, in the past with a 16 channel desk and, you know. Yeah, yeah. and the uh, Yamaha RM1Xs? Uh, SU700s. Oh, were they SU700s? No, I'm talking, yeah, yeah, I'm not, I'm talking about the, even before that when, when I, uh -huh. when I, you know, brought basically the entire studio on stage, you know, but, um, but yeah, I, I toured for a, for a long time with, um, the Yamaha S, uh, SU seven hundreds with two of them. That's right. Mixing, mixing between, um, yeah, mixing between them because they could only hold one song at a time. <laughs> oh, uh, okay. Yeah. I so, thought they um, were. I thought I totally thought they are on one X, but now that I'm looking at the picture of it, I could see the color buttons and. and I do. R M one X was the first like machine I ever bought. Oh yeah. Yeah, and I've. I mean. I used the shit out of it. I never back then. I wasn't releasing any music though at all. This was like in like ninety nine, two thousand. Let me check. Let me check what that looked like, David, because I it's, don't think it's like a know. it's like a blue, like a baby blue, color, like kind of workstation. But that's virtual analog or something. I from that from the uh, AN one X family as well. I think it was digital. Oh, I, had, I had a friend who used to use it as a MIDI sequencer to all of his external gear. It was kind of like the, the mother of his whole studio. Yeah, th this was, that was the only machine I had. I had nothing else, not even a computer at that point. I was making all of my tracks inside that. I still have... Oh, still yeah, have, yeah, yeah. The, I still oh, have yeah. burned CDs with tracks that I made in there. They sound terrible. 
I don't mean to change the subject, but um, this SU700, why did you select that particular sampler to use? Because it's a performance instrument. It's a, it's a really flexible thing, you know, you can... Uh, you could do things which which uh which at the time were uh pretty uh awesome you know um i i, I consider them as a as a three or three for samples basically because you could uh, you know some of you had four banks of looping uh, slots for four four loop slots i mean not four banks but four four loop slots for one shot and for something else and at least there were 12 12 slots and and they would treat samples differently in every section hmm. uh, like you can like you can choose a machine um on an octa track you know like a machine to uh, have your sample uh, be treated in a different yeah. way yeah um and so so one of one of the groups would uh, slice it into 16th like rex file type stuff yeah. you know <clears throat> and um and then the other one would just would just loop it, and the other one would just be a one shot uh, MP like a MC, uh, MPC type thing, okay. yeah. And uh, and then you could uh, assign one of the um, uh, things from out of the entire chain, whether it's an EQ thing or a filter thing or an effect send or whatever per per track. Um, so each slot you could assign one knob uh, to do whatever. Uh, you know, to have like one could be, you know, your your a pitch thing, or, and the next one could be, um, yeah, anything from the whole chain of effects that it, that is provided, basically. So it's a very, um, I mean, yeah, it's a very very flexible thing, you know, very flexible machine to to build one track, and then when you basically exhaust it, jamming with, with that one uh, selection of samples, I would mix into the next one, just beat match it by hand, and um, uh, yeah, and then just do another jam with the uh, with the next one. You know, do you do you feel that this SU seven hundred had a a particular impact on the sound that you were making at the time when you were touring? Yeah, they sounded absolutely terrible, but really, uh, uh, really messy and very very bad. You know, very low. Well, maybe five. not. I'm not talking about specifically fidelity wise, but I mean okay. stylistically. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, because they were they were limited as well as they were flexible. Okay. Um, you know, once you've done 20 tracks with them, uh, you've exhausted all the uh, possibilities and you make um, you make up new things, you know, with different combinations. But um, um, I mean, it's not nothing comparable to anything you can do with samplers these days, you know, but at the time it was. Um, um, yeah, it was basically at that time, the only thing you could really do is what an MPC could do, you know, uh, or an old school MPC, which is, you know, making loops and patterns and stuff. And this could, you know, uh, this was a performance instrument that could um, would allow you to to be much more hands on with with uh, treating the samples, you know. So you used it also to produce tracks too in the studio. First, I toured with them, and then uh, I made throughout uh, the time span of about two years, I made like a uh, hundred tracks just to play live. Like and so, for instance, like tracks like Crack or Bug Mod or something. Yeah, yeah. Like so that. I toured. I toured with them first. I toured with them first, and and then uh, every weekend when I would come home, uh, I would just do do new do new tracks during the week and take them on the road in the weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, and at some point, I had a massive arsenal of of tracks, and I did uh, uh, some recordings, and that became the Loudboxer album. So it was all it existed in in live format on the SUs before. Um, before the album was done, and they were basically all jams that I did with uh, the SU seven hundreds, and kind of split them out a little bit and sort of touched them up uh, slightly. But it basically all live. That whole album is a live thing. I I finally surfaced your secret then. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a secret. It's just uh, what I used at the time, and I sometimes I I also ran the nine hundred nine in sync with it, you know, to get more sort of uh, punchiness and uh, because the SUs tended to squash the sound very much you know it's everything sound basically became a wall of sound it, yeah, it totally. was all very there was no separation it was all very dirty and messy um, I, I guess I'm just pegging you and asking you because I think that era of tracks when you were making the that series of, of records was it like all the artwork was done by like designer republic or something or yeah yeah and I've always wondered how you were able to get that sound SU seven hundred that, that consistency, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. Um, yeah, I did. I did do so. I, it's not like the 
um, classic SU700 sound because I bought the um, output boards for it, you know, the, the multi output output boards. So I think I was able to do six outputs uh, on oh, each okay. machine. So they were split out in for the final mixes that I released, you know, but when I would play live, it was just stereo out. You still well, own them? I've got six of them. Six? Yeah. <laughs> like still they, them or not really? No, no, no. I actually lent them to uh, uh, my neighbor, Mitchell, Stranger, you know, Stranger. Yeah, he was intrigued. I, he was in, intrigued by them, so I gave him one. See, I'm I'm curious to see what he comes up with. Oh, um, but yeah, they would break down all the time, and uh, especially also the the drives that I used with them. Um, they only they had these scuzzy, like old the scuzzy one hmm. ports on the back, and uh, the only the only thing they would take was zip drives, and they would fuck up all the time. And I traveled with uh, six drives, you know, just, you know, just hot swap them during gigs when when some broke down, you know. That's what I made, made me finally finally made me stop doing shows with them because they were so unstable. Um, but uh, it was fun though. <laughs> Do Maybe it, it was just the bass rattling the components inside or something. I don't know. They 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 weren't as solidly built, but they were they were just the the thing that I used at the time. You know, there was uh, I've, I found them one day. I thought, wow, this must be really cool to play with live. You know, and and uh, you could also do restarts like you know mill style. Uh, with one button instead of stop start, it just with yeah. one button return to zero, like da, 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 really, really yeah. cool. <laughs> and that's really, really fun. Um, yeah, just really rough and uh, hands on, you know, just very quick and dirty. That was, was the sound. Mm. Fuck yeah. <laughs> that's nice. I'm going to totally looking one up on eBay now. <laughs> <laughs> Price that is happens, going up now. That happens to yeah. you every every time we talk. You're always you're always researching stuff and uh, hovering over buying buttons and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> right about to buy it now, but add to wish. Let's yeah. Okay. Say. Okay. Fair. That's safer hey, to do. Hey Mo, what was that? What was that old? Was it the RM One X you said you were interested in buying again? Yeah, I saw an RM One X recently at a pawn shop. It was sitting there. The guy was. It was a guitar pawn shop. And the guy was selling it for like. 80 bucks or something like that and I, oh, I remember wow. that i had a friend of mine who used to produce drum and bass and he did everything on the rm1x and uh i was like nah, you know I'm now now we're on on this subject i'm i'm telling you um and also everybody in the um, in the in the youtube chat you know this is the time to buy 90s groove or 2000s groove boxes because that's the next thing that's going to come back you know su700s um, also, the the other Yamaha things like the DX two hundred mm -hmm. and um, uh, MC three hundred threes, or uh, you know, yeah, the things, things from yeah, the groove the groove boxes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. They, things from those those times. There there are some really crazy ones too. Like um, there's this Roland Looper thing. I don't know what it's called. I don't remember what it's called. There's one here. Uh, I'll, I'll look it up. But it's it does like four samples. It's like a very early Octatrack kind of thing. You know, mm -hmm. like a um and um yeah but it's all it's some digital stuff though right yeah it's great it's yeah it's like the it's it's a bit crappy but um i think um you know because they, they're so instant and so quick um right, yeah. i think that's that's um even if you use it as as a part of your production you know just a yeah. um yeah yeah, just a quick thing to make a loop and then just dress it up in inside Ableton or inside another uh, yeah. environment. Yeah, Roland had pumped out a lot of those groove boxes in the nineties. The MC five hundred five, the three hundred three. They had that EF EF four SH thirty two synthesizer. Check out the EF three hundred three. EF three hundred three. That's uh, one of my favorite favorites. My my friend when oh, I was yeah. in high school used to work at the Roland at the Roland uh, distribution company. And he uh, got a employee discount and got the the groove box a long time ago. And I remember being blown away by the little um, what was it called? The little touch, like you can, ah yeah 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 with the with the, the beam yeah yeah it was yeah. called the, the beam. beam yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were like you know, whoa this is wild. <laughs> you know what's funny about that D beam is um, I was at one of our one of the interface warehouse parties that we had thrown um, when we were doing the droid parties. Um, Victor Carrillo, a friend of ours who owned a record store here in LA, he was, he's like, I really want to meet you, want you to meet this guy. And he walked me over to a guy who was sitting in a wheelchair and uh, he introduced me to him and he told me, this is the guy who invented the D-beam. 
for all the Roland products. <laughs> and uh, I started talking to him because I was just like, we were just nostalgically laughing over like the SP-808 sampler had the D-beam controller on it and a bunch of other things. And then I found out that he was also the guy who invented the power glove for the NES. Oh, so oh, he wow. actually converted the Nintendo Power Glove um, technology into the Roland D-Beam stuff, and then he, he licensed that Roland thing to all of their product line, which I think a huge amount of their products had the Roland D-Beam on it. Yeah, in the beginning. Yeah. I don't know if it really worked out in the end. <laughs> yeah, I think Alesis made an Air Effects one, too, like short. Oh, it was like a, the, it's like, a, like a... Like a little like a, dome? A dome, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember I, that. I think there was just something about like the '90s and raves where everybody just wanted to control the music <laughs> with their hands. <laughs> Did you ever have anything like that, Yoko? Um, <laughs> you wear some gloves mm, with lights. No, yeah, yeah. I wish. <laughs> uh, I can't remember. Um, uh, what is it? The, I've used I've used the nunchucks. You know, the, there's a uh, nunchucks. Yeah, the the Wii nunchucks. The Wii remember? nunchucks, yeah. Oh, yeah. there's actually <laughs> there's some, this uh... box. Have you guys seen this before? Uh, uh, modular company. Their name is slipping me, and I know the guys from Berlin, and they're going to be pissed if they see this. And I, and I totally forgot <laughs> that. But it's actually based on the same D beam thing that from the Roland thing, except it has nothing but CV outputs, so you can control your entire modular system with your hands, multiple parameters. Do you have to actually touch it, or is it just by how far? Coma. You... Somebody in the comments said that Coma Electronics made it. Oh, Coma. Okay, of course. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Senna de Jong. Let's say hi to some people. Senna, what's up? <laughs> what's up? Uh, Let's see. Yeah, Coma. Um, Dennis is here. Let's say uh, hello to Dennis. <clears throat> okay. What's up, Dennis? <laughs> 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 I must be forgetting a lot of other people. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, I saw Chris joined us in the beginning also. Chris, Chris. leaving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't, it's oh, I Dean. Chris. Dean's Wolf. like Dean's in the chat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's a can homie. You, can you do that way. from your end as well? Uh, throw in the comments, or is it only? No, I don't think so. We're just you looking know? it up on, okay. on the on the browser itself. Oh, okay. Oh, you need you need the app to do that. No, I I think oh, yeah. you need to be the host. You need to be the host, I guess. Oh, Pooja says hi. Yeah. Hi guys. Hey. Hello. Hey Pooja. <laughs> Oops. Hola. So, Marcus, have you been very productive in the studio, making a lot of music for this? <laughs> Well, last yeah, like the last thirty days, I didn't do anything. <laughs> Good for you. Um, because yeah, I, I don't know why. I just record sounds. I don't. Yeah, I I just uh, I think I will just create a library, and then when the studio is set up, I will go through everything, and then let's see. But yeah, before I did like tons of tracks, like. Yeah, I don't know. I and like you've, you've recently also started doing live shows, right, Marcus? Yeah, I started with that June 28th team. Oh, you don't sound too excited. <laughs> yeah, no, I just, I, I, I was just thinking about that, yeah. Yeah, okay. but I, I didn't play a lot. Like, I think I played three live shows in a club mm -hmm. or festival and uh, one on this uh, live stream. Uh, a few months ago, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm not that experienced. Um, yeah. What's in your What's your live setup like? Uh, MPC Live TR8S. Uh, then I have some Alesis Microverb uh, and Strymon Timeline. No laptop. No laptop. No. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Not for that kind of project. Maybe, maybe in the future for something different. But um, yeah, my approach was always: if I'm gonna do live, I don't want to have a laptop there. Yeah. So yeah. And are you like? Oh, sorry, Carlos. 
Oh, I was just gonna say, are you are, are your live sets like tracks that you've made, or are you actually just making stuff? It's a it's a mixture. I, I forgot the I forgot the Xboxbox. I also have the Xboxbox with me. Mm. Um, yeah, it's a, like stuff I've already finished in the studio, stuff which is released, and stuff which yeah maybe just, never no. come out and is just like exclusive for that. Yeah. Okay. Mm. And do you uh, uh, program things on the fly, or is it um, all pre uh, on the on the MPC live? Everything mm -hmm. is like pre-programmed, uh, like loops and yeah, one shots. Um, and on the TR8S, I program everything live, and yeah. sometimes also on the Xboxbox. But I also have like uh, pre-programmed sequences on there, so. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's pretty handy. You can travel with it uh, with just one person. Um, hand do you luggage. Feel, do you feel with that setup you have the um, the amount of control you would like to have over your sound? Because you are very meticulous and very, uh, you know, when you listen to your productions, it sounds like it's very. Um, all very tuned and very uh, is it <laughs> yeah very very yeah, yeah I, I, think, no, I think so well, too yeah i mean okay. it's, there's there are no uh, frequencies that are piercing your ears it's all very round and, and punchy and kicking yeah um but if you use a live tr8 for example um tr8 it S. sounds sound yeah so, sorry, sorry yeah. tr8s yeah. um, even though it's a very nice machine and very flexible to play live the amount of control you have over the sound it sounds a bit uh to be honest, uh, in my ears, a bit plasticky, you know. And and when I listen to your productions, it sounds very solid and very uh, designed and very. Um, I mean, I, I'm just wondering if you feel like you have enough control. That's basically the question. I would say yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I. What I do is uh, on the TRADS, I. Um, yeah, I imported my own sounds, mm. and. Yeah, well, it's not like exactly the same like in when I run it through Ableton or something, but um, I think you rarely can spot the difference in a club, I would say. Mm. So Okay, so you load up your own sounds, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I have uh, dif yeah, different sounds mm. um, which I can uh, go through and change on the fly. Yeah. Yeah, I have a period that's myself. I haven't yeah, even I haven't bothered to take the time to dive into it yet. Yeah. What? Oh, hey. Yeah, yeah, Colleen was there. <laughs> you, were, you were looking the other way. Just saying hi to Lady <laughs> Starlight. Hey, Lady Starlight. Hey. Hello, how you doing? Um, the the TR8S, I've never really played with it very much. Like, you could, obviously, it has a sampler, right? And you can load in. Yeah, you have a um, SD card slot. Yeah. Um, so that's one way to import, and I think you can also import it uh, via USB. And okay. which I really liked is uh, that you have like separate outputs. That's what I didn't like with the TR8 because I I just want to have reverb on the hi hats, for example. So yeah, mm. that's that's possible now. So yeah. But but is it like loops or one shots that you can load one shots in? Uh, okay. also loops also loops. um but i just use one shots does yeah. it like but can it does it like stretch them automatically to your template? to be honest i i never tried that okay. out because i just wanted to have my one shot there to be more flexible so mm -hmm. yeah i didn't put on loops for loops i have the mpc live right um yeah okay yeah, the one thing I like about the TR8S that I didn't like about the TR8 is it doesn't have a green bezel around it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you got the you got a faceplate for yours, didn't you, for the TR8? Yeah, I also taped around the sides of it with gaffer tape because I just couldn't stand the way it looked. But, <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, mine is I don't even use it anymore. It's just off to the side now. It's not even plugged in anymore. I just uh, I, I probably want to sell it. I don't. I don't have use for it anymore. You I mean, you have a nine oh nine. So, 
Well, hold on for 20 years. I'll take Yoakum's advice. <laughs> this will be worth a thousand dollars. Well, the thing is that um, I think they've been made in such Huge massive quantity. numbers. Yeah. 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 Uh, so, it doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I have my 808, a real 808 back there, but I still tend to sometimes gravitate to the TR8S or even my little small Roland TR08 more times than usual, just out of convenience, convenience. more than anything. Yeah, that's I what I used, to, I used to have them like that on the desk too, and I would just fire it up really quick. Yeah, I find that my my real TR808, the kick drum is has always been kind of weird because every single 808 is different. No, no, none is exactly the same. But I have this weird issue where the decay is inconsistent. Like if I turn the decay all the oh. way up, it goes boom, boom, boop. Like one of them will be a really <laughs> short one, and then it'll be okay. long, Donkey. long, 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 short, long, long. And I've had so many techs try to look at it and try to see if they can figure it out. Like they turned the trim pot a little bit down, thinking that maybe the oscillator was cutting off the decay of the next step or something. But no one's ever really been able to fix it. So it is. Was so this like a factory defect kind of a thing? It's a factory. Uh, what's it called? Uh, perk. Perk. You know, it's a. Oh, I mean, you can always it's just a feature. It, it's the same <laughs> kick drum. You can just sample it. Yeah. But all the other sounds work fine. Yeah, Maybe everything should... else works perfectly fine, except actually my snare drum has an incredibly long decay, but I love it. Uh, it sounds okay. like more of like a white noise decay. Here's an answer. It could be. Uh, it's, I don't know, it could be, uh, uh, it's normal as it's a resonance based synth. I don't know, yeah. it's a, I think the kick drum has its own dedicated oscillator. So, so I don't know, I don't know if there's a resonance um, part in that chain as well. I don't know. I have no idea. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Hey, John Hester <laughs> showed up again. Uh, oh, Yo, what's up, John? John, <laughs> the hey. dancing machine. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> the dancing machine. What's up, John? <laughs> Do you use uh, stuff from the boutique uh, series? Anyone? No, yeah, no. I have a TR09, TR08. I know David does as well, but I don't really use them. They're more like if somebody had come up to me in the 90s and told me, Would you like a toy, cheap, small <laughs> yeah. version of a 909 and an 808? Would you buy it? I'd be like, Fuck yeah, I'd buy it. So it becomes like a fun little thing to play with outside of my studio, but. I do use the JP08 boutique. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I really I, like I have the TR08 because like that's my that's my 808. I don't have a real 808. <clears throat> so I use that. I have the JU06, which I like, and the SH01. I use those quite a bit. Yeah. I would love a real 808. Mo almost sold me it. Yeah. I might, I might sell it to you again as soon as the next house payment comes up that I can't pay. <laughs> <laughs> David's on my quick dial to buy my 808. Well, hey, at least you'll still be in the family if you ever want it back later on. Yeah, for sure. You know? As long as you agree to sell it to me for the same price as I the sold it to you. The same price, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, Bo. They're worth six grand now. I mean, do you think the price will just keep going up on those things? I think like, so. Yeah? Uh, Even with all the remakes? I don't know. Well, the thing is, you know, we were, we were discussing YouTube earlier, but one thing that has, has happened is it made, even though they were the, some of these instruments were iconic in, in the producers' uh, circles, but now they are like iconic worldwide to everyone, you know? Everybody knows what an 808 kick is these days, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I think it's the same for like the brand Moog, for example. You know, it's like uh, it's become this huge iconic um, thing. So I, I think it, it'll re they will definitely retain their value. Yeah. Um, but like they just keep going up in price like crazy. I don't know. There must be a point where they're going down again because they're not. Uh, at some point, they will, they will break down. You know, I don't know yeah. how long an 808. They're, they're, they're forty year old machines by now. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And that, I think that's what I was about to say. I mean, I could be wrong, but I I think. As time goes by, there will be less and less and less functioning working, ones. yeah, working ones, yeah. And as they yeah. become more and more rare, the price can only go up. Not as a useful tool in the studio to make music, but purely as maybe collectors. even someday as a museum collector. Exactly, piece, yeah, like an know? iconic uh, instrument from yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Um, How many eight ways do you have, Yoko? <laughs> I have one, but there are two in the studio. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because you know, do you I, guys do you guys follow Egyptian Lover on Instagram? No. 
He's got like eight or ten. Oh, fuck yeah. <laughs> of course. Yeah. He has like this crazy custom one. And then he just had I because I randomly asked the question on the Instagram comments. Maybe he would answer or not. I said, how many eight ways do you have? I think he said he has an eight or ten. Fair enough. Wow, yeah, man. John Tejada has a really tricked out 808 too. It's got switches all up and down the sides of it and extra knobs for tuning for every instrument. Hmm. So it's got a modded to send MIDI and see uh, MIDI and uh are those the the, the Robin Whittle uh modifications? I don't remember what the same the same guy who does the devil fish basically. Possibly. He does 808. Yeah. I just remember going to a studio and saying like holy shit, that thing is decked out. I mean he's got Tons and tons of switches on this 808. <clears throat> yeah, man. yeah, I mean, I use it. I use it uh, in production sometimes, but um, it's also very often in the setup, just as a as a, a tool, you know, because you have these three trigger outs, and um, uh, yeah, it does patterns with any any length, you know, stuff yeah. like that. So it's 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 a sort of very basic sequencing tool as well sometimes you're in the studio are you making much techno these days Yoko? um well yeah i make everything but whatever comes out comes out i don't plan on making um, um a techno track you know when it comes out as a techno track i'm happy but or, or I'm, I'm happy with everything that comes out you know i don't plan for things you know i'm okay. not i'm not thinking as like you said you really want to do something functional yeah i just want to have fun making music <laughs> whatever that, happens happens you know and it's all stuff you're releasing on store. Uh, yeah. the, the recent, recently, yes, yeah, recent uh, couple of years, it's all uh, jams uh, that I uh, throw on vinyl on store. Yeah. Oh, okay. Nice. I think I I fall in line with that same thought process as well. I stop trying to go into the studio with a with a plan of what I needed to accomplish for the day because I just felt like it just kind of squashed my creativity. I just want to be able to sit down on my computer and select a tempo and just start fucking around and seeing what happens. You I can't force it anyway. So. Yeah, I, I often got the tempo on a, on a MIDI fader. Oh, yeah. do you? Yeah. Oh. So whenever you're doing something and, you know, halfway down the, whatever you're doing, just whack it and see what happens. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a good idea. I just have to... Gonna... My, my mindset's always just, just damn, damn, dance music, dance music, dance music. I need to... I need to open up my, <laughs> open up my horizons. But but you know, for, like you, David and Marcus. I mean, I I really admire that you are able to to you know just pump them out in series like there is no tomorrow. You know, it's like it's <laughs> always and it's always consistent. I I I can't I can't believe how consistent your music is. You know, it goes for both of you. Thank you. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I don't know why it is like that, but yeah. I guess that's that's it's a that's lucky, a, lucky it's gift. The mindset, yeah, it's yeah. Like mindset's always there. Where it's like if I were to try to write any other type of music, I'd probably fail miserably. But <laughs> but but I don't go in the in the studio and say, okay, I have to do a like a banger for the club or something because that won't work for me. I just switch everything on and then let's see, you know. Yeah. And if I, if I have something interesting. I go on, you know, like yeah, simple as that. And I, what I also learned, which was pretty hard to learn, um, that there's also like phases where you are simply not creative. So, okay, accept it and try it the other day. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's been me the last three months. I haven't really been writing much music. It's it's been really. There was like there this this random spurt a month ago mm. that I was just like I think I had like five tracks that I kind of finished or almost finished, but before that it was nothing. I would get in the studio and turn on the machines and mess around and just nothing happened. I don't feel anything, you know. Like I I always have to go with feeling too. So nothing happens and I just walk away. I just like oh you know yeah. what I'm not gonna force it. Yeah, but I'm that's gonna... something you have to learn, you know, like. Because I know people who go into the studio and really try to force it, and then they Break get like heads. super, yeah. yeah, they get super unhappy and like, yeah, depressed or something like that. You know, like 
Uh, yeah, luckily for me, depression's always fueled me to write music. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, it's always a good way to to vent as well for me. Yeah, if I don't feel good, I always do the more harder stuff. Then, so there you go. <laughs> it's gonna manifest itself in one yeah. way or the other. But, yeah, but uh, yeah, go on. No, I was just saying, like, just in the last three months myself, I, I think even just this whole pandemic and everything going on politically and globally in the world has really influenced me to make music somehow. I think I've been able to channel my frustration of what's going on just mm -hmm. into my computer. I don't know if it'll ever get released or if it's even good enough to release, but it's certainly been just a, like my punching bag just to get mm -hmm. things out of my system and be able to write stuff. So. But Mo, if you think it's good enough... Who good enough in whose eyes? In my own, I mean, I guess I'm my own. I'm my own worst critic, but you know, I I've, put it I've, away. Yeah, I put it away for later. But I, I've managed yeah. to actually finish some stuff to release. Like I'm, I'm doing a new hypoxia cassette tape that's coming out in a couple of weeks, which I wrote over this whole pandemic period. Oh, nice. And me and Luis also finished. Um, new belief defect track that we put on the m division the guys who do the gamma festival up in in um st petersburg russia we, we we finished a track for their compilation as well so it's been productive how what about the rest of the album for belief defect i know, uh, it's, I I know it's on hold but <laughs> how far did you guys get before everything i can't remember Jeez, I and mean, we have like probably seven skeletons of tracks that I think is like solid as fuck, but I don't know. We found it kind of difficult to work on that stuff remotely online. I yeah. think we really need to get back in the studio together to, to actually polish it off. Right, right. And him being in Berlin and here, uh, me in the US, and the fact that the EU is probably not going to be letting Americans travel over there anytime soon, I think, indefinitely. <laughs> <laughs> this record, yeah, this time. record's on hold. Yeah, Luis will have to come to LA. Yeah, he should. <laughs> cool. Looking forward to that uh, hypoxia stuff too, man. Yeah, absolutely. I can't wait to share it with you guys. When do you plan on putting that out? Um. Well, I mean, I turned it into the pressing plant about a week ago, and sure, it takes about three weeks. So I'm not going to even really. Um, mess with the whole like one month of promo campaign or anything like that. As soon as the tapes arrive at my door, I'm going to put them on Bandcamp the next day and just put them for sale. Do you do promo campaigns for Hypoxia? Not necessarily. I mean, I, I sometimes I would just do like a fat drop to close friends, but I mean, it's it's not DJ music, so I'm not sending it right, to right. A, a huge group of DJs and just people that I know that actually appreciate listening to that kind of or space. Akuma, Akuma, I, never got one. I never got a promo from him. Because I just sent it to you over <laughs> iMessage or something. You said good friends. And I'm, I'm not out there. <laughs> because every time I show you my hypoxia shit, you're like, ah, this, this shit's fucking boring, man. <laughs> <laughs> I never said that, dude. No, I'm fucking around. <laughs> hey, but David, have you, have, you, have you recorded anything at all ever uh, which is not uh, a groovy track? Yeah, yeah, I have. I, I've like, like I've like try to try to make some like flying lotus type hip hop beats. Oh, okay. Nice. Um, I've showed Mo some of it. He said it was okay. You thought it was boring, probably. <laughs> probably, yeah. <laughs> it's been, like, this stuff sucks, Just put it away. I mean, I have. That's good. I have. I don't know, maybe fifteen or twenty tracks like that, not completely finished, but mm. just ideas because I I really enjoy those kinds of like jazzy weird funky beats as well yeah and, i wouldn't uh, undersell it because a lot of the hip-hop stuff you've sent me like the kind of jay dilla beat stuff that you've done that shit's been pretty i good, can man. dude i can imagine i can imagine if you would do hip-hop stuff or you know other uh, other beats than than sort of housey or techno -y beats you know yeah uh it, it must be fucking slamming stuff <laughs> I'll, yeah, I'll, can't I'll be anything. You, I'll send you some of the. I'll send. Ah, some yeah, I would love to hear it, man. Yeah, yeah, it's you know. I mean, maybe like most said, I'm. I might be my own toughest critic because I compare myself to like. I'll be like, this doesn't sound as good as a Jay Dilla track or Flying Lotus, you know, and because I really look up to those guys as producers, and 
I just kind of kind of discourage myself and would be like, ah, oh, you know, I'm gonna come back to it later on. But during this quarantine period, I haven't even I haven't even revisited them. But I have a lot of a lot of projects loaded that I could probably return to. And mm. I don't know. I would like to though. I I told Mo like because he's before years ago. He's like, why don't you put out an album? I said, if I do an album, I don't want it to be a techno music album. Right. Like, I want to just do. I'd rather do this kind of stuff, like stuff that you can chill, listen to, like because I listen mm. to a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Like on the airplane or going for walks, and you know what I mean. Like on my own time, I like just. It's it's more background music, you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. So I want to have that instead of putting out twelve, you know, club tracks. <laughs> and yeah, I can just really just release as EPs, you know. So I'm I'm working on it, man. I'll send you cool. some of the I'll send you some of the sketches I have so you can hear what I'm doing. Yeah, cool. I would love to uh, check it out for sure. Yeah. yeah. And you, Marcus? Um. Well, actually, the whole pandemic thing made me think about uh techno music and the whole whole stuff going on and um actually i have some ideas on my mind uh to do more experimental like i would say yeah chill chill out music or something like that um but yeah i don't know how right. to how to start and yeah okay it's it's i think it's a it's a long way to go but i i really want to realize those kind of projects mm. because uh i listen to a lot of stuff like that uh especially now you know i nearly don't listen to any club music at the moment mm. plus another thing too with like the those hip-hop beats for me i i don't know how to play an instrument i don't know music theory yeah. So I get locked up on on how chord pro- progressions should be, and you know what I mean. So that also kind of gets me a bit uh, discouraged to keep working because it's like to well, me it's, I, uh, it it sounds just, like to me it sounds good, but I'm like, but is this right? Is this how it's supposed to go? Who cares? Go? Who cares? That's the sure. thing. Like I, I think can, I don't I think I asked that. Wow. Okay. Okay. Well, I don't know. I mean, I think. Um, you know if you if you were like mo mentioned things like dilla and stuff like that you know it's um it's it's that kind of stuff is you know his stuff is very very musical but also very much very often very wrong in a musical yeah. sense you know yeah uh, because you know things were you know kind of uh timed in a weird way and then used samples and pitched in weird ways and going against each other but you know in a whole at the the end thing is so musical you know and so yeah free and jazzy and, and, and funky. Uh, yeah. I don't think you have to worry about, I mean, in, in, in techno or in groovy music, like you do mostly, um, you don't, you don't care about whether a chord is in, in tune or out, or out of tune with the percussion or the, the bass drum or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I very... mean, it, that's just the way, the way it sounds good in your ears is the only, yeah. uh, um, measure. Tell. Yeah. 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 Even when I guess. sometimes when you put in wrong notes and they're in the wrong key or whatever, I mean that that kind of atonal sound can add to the whole flavor of the track and yeah. make it what it is. It doesn't need perfection. Um, yeah, I wouldn't get too hung up on things like that. Just, just that that's the one that hangs me up because like I I feel like if I put out a a track that's not it doesn't sound like maybe it'll sound musically pleasing to me, but other people will be like, whoa, that sounds weird. I don't know. I guess that is a good thing. Well, you're actually one of the things that I've always appreciated about David's perspective towards techno. Cause like, I've always been so meticulous and like making sure all the techno <laughs> tracks that I've done is so perfect. And I'd be like, David, well, what do you think about this? Or this doesn't sound or like, dude, who fucking cares? It's just techno. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like it's just techno. You got to add that same perspective towards the other stuff. You I know. Do. It's, it's, well, I don't know why I can't, who cares? I don't know why I can't do that for some reason. Yeah. Simo. Steve-o. Steve-o, what's up, man? Hey. <laughs> he's probably in a mountain somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. He's climbing or snowboarding or something. <laughs> I see Oliver Dodd in the chat room, which he built all my modular cases for me. What's up, Oliver? Oh, oh. where is he? Oh, yeah, here we go. Oh, he's, has, he's got a question. Can you talk about promos? Not sure what everyone is i'm not sure what that question means no i don't either <laughs> <laughs> well let's just say hi to oliver then 
<laughs> Maybe he wants to be on your promo list, Mo. Maybe. Oh, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Word. Yeah, Simo's in the mountains, you see? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Of course. Good oh, choice. I'm not sure what everyone's using for promo. Ah, using. Oh, you use mean promo Patrick. distribution. Right? I, I yeah, use probably. Um, I think the last promos I've done were... I did them through uh, Modern Matters, so I just used whatever their service was. Oh, they have, I think they have their own. Yeah. They have uh, their own little website. Who's your ghost producer? Some lady <laughs> who died in my room 10 years before I was born. She's my ghost producer. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> Oh man! Well, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Well, about promos, I don't do promos. No. No. <laughs> oh, that's good to know. At least I know you were just aren't single me, singling me out. I thought, I thought I just wasn't the ones getting your tracks. <laughs> the thing is, uh, when when I started my label SCKT, it was vinyl only. Oh, okay. So I did like did it the old school way. I did like. 30 test pressings, stamped them, yeah. sent them to people I respected and still played vinyl. Yeah. And then, yeah, let's see. And I did it for the first three re -re releases, I think. And then, yeah, I, I stopped doing it because yeah, no one played vinyl anymore from those people I sent that. So, yeah. If they want to have some music, just yeah, they they drop me a mail, so yeah. Yeah, we That's we do just, we do the same. We don't we don't do any promo with the uh, yeah. store. We just uh, add them to the to the collection uh, to the yeah. archive. It's not really a the store is not really a la really a label. It's more like a uh, like an archive. Yeah, like an archive. Yeah, uh, yeah. So whenever something is done and finished, we cut it and we put it in the archive, and it. it People who've bought records on the store before, they they will get notified on Bandcamp, you know, because they've yeah. they've they've bought something before. But that's pretty much it. Um, I guess there's no way for me to go back and start collecting old back catalog store stuff, then. Huh? Um, most of it is all sold. Most of, most of it is sold out. Um, but yeah. we do have a, a feature for um, subscribers that we cut to order. Hmm. So. Oh, wow. That's cool. Uh, do you have your own cutting machine? Yeah, that was the whole point of the of the project. Yeah. yeah. Oh. So it's uh, this this room is uh, is is basically just made as a as a playground, you know, for myself and people who collaborate. And um, anything, anytime something interesting happens, you know, during a jam or during a recording day, um, uh, and and we all agree that this is something we we want to keep. Um, we uh, we tuck it away until we 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 fill like two sides of vinyl, and then we cut it. And it's and it's in theory. I mean, it's not always the case, but in theory, it's in the shop the next day. You know? oh, so wow. there's no re there's no release date or anything. So we don't we don't pick a date in the future saying okay, this is going to be the release date of this and this project. It's just when it's finished, it's added to the archive. Yeah. Um, so we that's why we don't do promo. It's just a, a, a continuous thing rather than. Um, oh, yeah. You know, shooting for uh, for a date uh, in the future one when you're already sick and tired of the music, <laughs> yeah. you know, and, or waited for the pressing plant or the promo people to catch up, and uh, um, so yeah, that's all. You know, all the boring stuff that that usually goes along with releasing something um, is chucked. You know, we just ditched it, and it's just there when it's done. It's an, yeah, I've, it's I've recently cool. started thinking about whether to keep doing promo or not. Yeah. Now it's like. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's an inter it's a completely interesting concept because as as a label to give all of your music away for free to the very small amount of people that could actually pay for it. Mm. You know, who actually utilize it and <laughs> We we give everything away for free in a sense that it's on SoundCloud and YouTube in in in, yeah. in full length uh to stream, you know. So it's it's there. If you want to listen to it, it's it's all there. Uh but we don't send out digital files or uh you know, to your potential customers, basically. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. 
does the cutting head that you guys use to cut records is it is it like flexible in 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 terms of like like old scully cutting heads where you can cut records backwards like from the inwards and cut no out, or is it oh yeah well forward? that well but cutting from inside to out outside doesn't have to do anything with uh, the cutter head that's just uh, how the motor runs you know because mm -hmm. it the, mo the the cutter head travels on a on a on a belt yeah on a yeah on a bar, on a bar. from from outside to in and it's just reversing that thing it'll be possible i've never cut some, something inside out on this machine but it's it's definitely possible if you can reverse the trajectory i guess um yeah there's all kinds of modifications possible to the cutting machine there's a, a precision plate which lets you cut to half speed so it mm -hmm. uh, turns really slow you get higher resolution and you can make deeper cuts mm -hmm. actually I was talking to Jamie yesterday um, I was working in uh, Willem 2 Studios yesterday in uh, in the south of Holland with uh, Albert van Abbe uh, collabor I'm collaborating with him at the moment and uh, Jamie stopped by Jamie Blawan and he has the same he has the same uh, record cutting machine as we do here oh, sure. so we uh, we got into a you know this exchange of uh, <laughs> uh, yeah techniques and findings because it's it's I must tell you know it's it is um, it's amazing to be able to do yourself but it's yeah. uh, it's a journey you have to you have to be really really dedicated yeah, and and dive into it and it's something you you don't it's not like you press a button and the rotary record cuts itself yeah. it's a really really uh, intense process with a lot of variables and you have yeah. to understand each variable before you understand what's wrong when something is not going the way you think it should go so it's um, um, yeah um, it takes about a year of trial and error and problem solving before you get the hang of it but it's it's worth it man it's so um, um, satisfying to be able to you know just do something in this room you know uh, and then eventually you cut the record and we send it out from from here as well so it's uh, it's all done in one place you know that's a fascinating process a, a good friend of mine his name is gil tamazian he has uh, capsule labs mastering here in los angeles i've known this guy for 20 plus more years but um back in the days he bought an old record press from rainbow records like a, an actual vinyl pressing machine and he has a long history of uh, working on cars, like completely building the engines and transmissions from scratch. And he basically took this whole press as in a project and re restored the entire press from scratch. Wow. And um, then he went and jumped into buying a record lathe and he kind of learned how to cut records because at the end of the day, he was making more money to stay in business from mastering and cutting records than he would be from pressing. Mm. But I pressed a lot of our records on that machine like he mm. taught himself how to run it and to the point where like you know i used to ask him to do me like for like a lot of the past epoxy records i did all these interesting swirled vinyls and different colors and mm. for him it was just a tedious process to do that stuff so he'd be like fuck dude i don't want to do all these colors if you want to <laughs> press these records yourself come over to the plant i'm going to teach you how to run the machine and just press the records yourself mm. so a lot of the old epoxy records I actually went into the pressing plant and like literally just sat there and like was hand cutting the putty the little patties into like different colors oh wow and putting them <laughs> in the machine and pressing them and doing them oh, one by one yeah and that whole process of being able to have your hands like involved in the manufacturing of your records mm. was was a fulfilling experience that like you could never purchase yeah true yeah we find yeah. it the same here you know and and the, the the good thing is um because all the middle people are, are uh, act, you know they are cut out from the process yeah. you can make you can keep on making the decisions uh, about anything in in the whole process um, like even even the cutting you know um, by, by learning it yourself you you learn where the limits are because you know if you, if you go cut a record at some um, record uh, cutting mastering engineer they will always tell you what can be uh, what can be done on vinyl and what is not possible and you know yeah. the restrictions and the process and the you know but when you actually do it yourself and understand why some things um, are not possible or you know come out better than uh, your digital file or how the compression works how the material behaves you know all that stuff you can keep on refining these things and finding out about the, all these details in the process and and make decisions along the way about it so 
Um, there is no stage in, in the whole process of um, thinking of an idea until it is on a, on a vinyl disc that you don't have control over, you know, it's all in your hands and that's, that's just, um, it's so much fun, you know. And it also changed, I must say, it changed the way um, I mix down or even uh, choose to arrange music, you know, or choose to um, uh, put stuff together because I know some things are just going to know, it's just not going to sound good on vinyl, you know. And some, yeah. some things will sound really good on vinyl and that's where you tend to go or tend to uh, lean towards, you know, when you make decisions. Are you mastering your music as well before no. you put it to run? No, no, no. Um, we, we, I'm, you know, I mix it down on on uh, on vibe, you know. Uh, so when it sounds good in 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 this in this room and when it sounds good in my ears, um, that's where I stop. And then the mastering is done by Tim at Manmade Mastering. Tim, yeah. And um, he's been involved in the process of, of store since since the beginning, so he knows what what we can cut and what we don't. Uh, what it needs, you know, for for us to be able to cut it, oh, and right. um, and uh, yeah. So, uh, but it's it's basically. I always ask him not to do too much to the EQs, or um, you know, he, he he touches it up and and makes you know everything sound sort of industry standard level wise and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, and sometimes you he rescues things because we were too quick uh, during the jam without thinking about phase differences or shit like that you know yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, or stereo sometimes there is stereo in the bass or you know because it was made so quick yeah. um, but it's it's mostly technical and then uh, when we get the masters back we try to cut them exactly the way they sound you know uh, the, uh, as the message that he provided wow. so we a b and eq on the way in as long you know just as long we get the same level and the same uh yeah uh characteristics yeah. and if if it if it's different it's by choice you know so if, if yeah. the final sounds different it's by choice because we feel it sounds um yeah it can be pushed a little bit more in a certain range or whatever so yeah, have you spent any time yourself just like experimenting with cutting like maybe just doing your own lock grooves or I mean, because me and David were having a discussion not long ago about all these different cutting processes. That's why I was asking about the reverse thing, like what Jeff Mills used to do the the double cuts, where it was like two tracks. Yeah, yeah like running every... from. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, it's it's basically just a very simple mechanical process, you know. Yeah. It's a it's a, a style is you know, vibrating very very loudly in yeah. you know and cutting into vinyl and and the whole machine is uh, is is as simple to understand as a bicycle. You know, it's uh, it's just a. You know things that move moving parts and, and you know it's very delicate delicate to calibrate but the process is is actually very simple yeah um but um yeah so yeah you can do all kinds of tricks i guess yeah was, I, I can't remember the name of that record yeah we spoke about it but yeah i tripped out and you just every time you pick up a needle it's like on a different groove and a different, a different track. track yeah it's so weird Oh, that's that's with two parallel spirals. Yeah, parallel. yeah. So so you cut one one spiral. Uh, yeah, that's we could actually do that if you if you make a wide groove distance. So so you you first have to cut the first groove, I guess, and then after that you have to find the exact point where that you left blank and do another spiral. Exactly. If you have the motor running at the same speed, it should basically, in theory, uh, make two parallel spirals. Yeah, spirals. Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> Maybe we all do. But the thing is, if you run into the into the groove that is already being cut, it completely will ruin the the stylus yeah. for sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Ruin the stylus or would ruin the. Oh yeah, the, the stylus the, like... because you're cutting into a, a groove that is already being cut. Uh, so it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is that breaks the stylus okay. for sure. I thought you just had to trash the lacquer and start over. <laughs> uh, what do you mean? Like the lacquer, the plate itself. Yeah. The record itself. I thought you just have to throw the record out. I didn't know it would damage the actual style. Yeah, if you if you um, I mean the if you cut uh, locked grooves, the problem with cutting locked grooves is that if you need if you leave the the stylus down too long, more than one rotation, it starts cutting in a groove that is already been cut, and that yeah. just fucks it up. Yeah. Well, speaking of lacquers, what about is there a shortage of lacquers yet because of the big factory that burned down here in California? We don't use lacquers. Uh, oh, you we use actual no. We actually we use actual vinyl. So actual actual uh, PVC vinyl. So le lacquer is acetate. You know that's a different yeah. material. It's much yeah. softer, and you you can cut in there with um, 
with sapphire styli yeah. and um, they are usually uh, those are the ones that if you if you cut your record at a, at a press uh, cutting uh, engineer to be able to um, to use for making the, the, the plates for for pressing that's what you usually do there you know you they have these big 17 inch uh, or 16 I don't know how big but they have these big lacquers and they're soft material that's why I have to use them and ship them in a, in a couple of days otherwise they start already deteriorating or you know, lose their um, fidelity um, you're, you're cutting each record one by one yeah yeah but oh, in wow. vinyl so so once once it's cut it's as durable as a vinyl a pressed vinyl record okay how, how many are you are you making for 50 each for each title maximum 50 oh okay yeah oh wow I didn't know that. I thought you were, I thought you were cutting the the the, mat, the lacquer and sending it and getting pressed. I was like, how do you get it in the same day, or the next day? No, no, it's all they they're all made one by one by oh. hand. You know, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So does that mean each record can come out sounding slightly different? Uh, they 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 are. If you would measure a run from start to finish, you know, start by start measuring the characteristics from the first record that is cut in the series. Mm -hmm. And then listen to the last one; they'll they'll be different. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. Okay. But but not. I mean, if it's if it's going to be too different, we'll change the stylus. Okay. And and uh, keep not the necessarily quality it's not consistent. Necessarily, it's okay. So it's not necessarily degradation of quality. It's just like some slight variations with frequencies. Uh, yeah, quality. I mean, sometimes the. Um, um, it it is all it is all I consider all of that an aesthetic, you know. It it can be nice to have something sounding a little bit less sharp and a slightly more, you know, muffled or lo-fi. Sure. You know what I mean? That's yeah. because the vinyl introduces that anyway. You know, it kind of cuts off um, the the super bottom end and the, the super high end. Yeah, um, and it kind and of plays if, into the DIY nature of of the of things as well. Yeah, and also if there there are regions in the mid range that you you can boost uh, in such a way that they start to saturate a little bit, so there's like a sort of like a band band pass saturation type f stuff going on, mm -hmm. and that can be really nice with you know hi hats that kind of you know become more dusty and dirty than they were in the recording. Yeah, um, that's what I like liked that. about. That's what I liked about a lot of these old records in the '90s. Is just the way the hi hats distorted on the vinyl. It yeah, just doesn't sound as good on a digital file. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can use that as an effect. Yeah, yeah you can. You can. That's why I said earlier because that 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 is so much fun to have control over the all these other uh, parts of the process. You know, you can keep on making decisions. You can experiment with a, a track, and um, you know, think okay, how how is going to sound if we push this region uh you know in the frequency range a little bit more so it becomes a bit more you know glued together and stuff like that you know you can yeah you can and there's always a sweet spot for everything you know and it's just yeah. a matter of finding them and I, I don't know very much about cutting machines but can you hear what's actually being cut like what's yeah. coming out of the cut? it's like a it's like it's like with an old school reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder you have a playing a head and a, and a recording head you know head. Okay. Um, so you hear what's so, actually what it's going to sound like on the vinyl. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So it's while it's cutting, uh, the cutting head makes uh, a, a shit amount of noise. You know, it's, it's it's really really loud. You know, because it's uh, uh, yeah, it's doing something under high high pressure. You know, it's a yeah. it's a very violent process actually, <laughs> cutting in vinyl. Yeah. Um, so it makes a lot of noise, but uh, yeah, you can put your you know listening tone arm. Uh, just behind it, uh, so you hear it like a second later, or half a second later. I don't know what's the interval, but oh, okay. um, uh, depends on what groove you're in too. It can be the groove that is just being cut, or a few grooves behind, you know. Okay. Um, but yeah, you can listen back to it while it's playing, while it's cutting. Um, is this yeah, one of the kind of one. lathes that run like on, on a Technique turntable or something, or is it like a complete? Uh, yeah, you 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 basically buy the machine and you have to provide your own motor. And um, 12, 12 tens are are basically the under limit of what's you know technology that is capable of uh, dealing with higher pressures because the the stylus when you when you cut is way more heavy than than uh, when you play back with a playback stylus. There's way more pressure on the mm -hmm. on the um, on the plate. Um, 
so but yeah you can use the sp what's it called sp12 you know the bigger motor uh techniques or any yeah. anything with a motor basically i mean these all these are all most cutters when they are not like the classics collies or neumanns or whatever they are usually um machines that are frankenstein together by the people yeah. who use them <laughs> you know change around the the cutter heads you know or the plates or um, the motors or whatever you know they're all I will, yeah when i was talking to jamie he 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 also modified his setup uh, the, uh, and and we did as well we did different things so we're gonna have some discussions about um you know maybe we learn something from each other but um yeah you can heavily modify everything i remember kiro That's had nice. one for a while running yeah i heard about that table. yeah yeah and i went over i wonder if he still has it i he lives in L.A. now, but when I saw him with it, he was living in Windsor in Canada at the time. I got to ask him about that. Mo, when you when you do the hypoxia stuff, were you also doing the cutting as well? No, no. I mean, Gil, Gil does the process just like you would in any normal pressing. Um, he cuts he cuts into um, like a lacquer. Mm-hmm. And he sends it off to get the metal works done, and they they spray, they make the the, the plates. We do like a two step processing on the plates, and then they mail the plates back. And then Gil will actually put the plates in the machine for me because he doesn't want me to fuck up the dies on the machine. <laughs> and then uh, he'll just be like, "Yeah, just go for it," because it, it's just a lot of physical labor to actually just continue to fill up the the vinyl pellets in the in the machine that melts them down, mm-hmm. and then they come off on a plate and. When the trim cuts the trimming around the record and they fall on the plate, you can't just leave too many stacked up or because they're still kind of warm and they start to melt yeah, down the side. Away. So you got to keep on staying on top of it and moving like stacks of 10 at a time, you know, until later where you can actually put them into individual sleeves. And the process of mixing colors on vinyls and getting swirls and stuff is quite, kind of complicated because you can't just put two colors into a bin because then it just melts it down to like... If you put yellow and blue, you'll get green. Or if you put too many colors, you just get like this shit brown color, which isn't really great. You actually have to, it's like a fine process of being able to put the right amount of blue and the right amount of white into the feeder at the exact same time. So that when it melts it down to a, like a little puck, it looks like a little hockey puck, and they press it, then you get these kind of colors and swirls and, and all these custom records. So... The process of doing that stuff is a lot harder than just letting the machine do its thing and press records. So since Gil doesn't have like a whole shitload of employees over there, he's like, look, if you want color records, just come here and do it yourself. But I don't really have the time to But that's here nice. I like the idea. Yourself. I like the idea of doing it on your own, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the yeah. purists out there will argue that color rec- colored vinyls don't sound as good as just like pure black. That was gonna, that was gonna be my my next well, question. Is like, a- is actually, it- actually, I think the transparent is sounding the best. I heard. Possibly, but I don't know. Why? Why is it? It's all the same material, isn't it? No, I not necessarily. Uh, I think the, you'll get more surface noise on hmm. on things that they add dyes and colors to than you would just like in. Like I would think only the composition of the material itself would uh, would make a difference. The color doesn't necessarily have anything to do with it, as long yeah. as the composition is is the same, you know. Yeah, um, I wouldn't be able to to argue on that one really well. I don't know. I've now. never, I've never. Yeah, that's that's just something I, I imagine. You know, it's a. Uh, All I know is that from putting my records on Bandcamp, I would get a significant amount of people who would be like. Do you just have any black vinyl? Because you know, I'm more <laughs> of like a hi-fi person, and I don't like the way colored vinyl sounds. Right. So I even started manufacturing like a hundred pure black records, and then I would do the rest of them in color, and then mm. I'd put them on my Bandcamp as an option: colored vinyl or black vinyl. Just pick the one you want. Ten dollars more for black vinyl. <laughs> <laughs> the good sounding ones. <laughs> I've only ever I've only ever had people tell me that they would prefer if it was pressed on the heavier. Uh, the gram vinyl, yeah, like 180, 180, gram. 180, 180 gram. Yeah. That's about it. I mean, the color stuff. Most people, they never, they never really had any issues with it. We should get somebody who's an expert on that kind of stuff to the show to explain it. Yeah, you, you mean try? what's what's the difference uh, on on more heavy vinyl or? Apparently, it sounds better and louder. I don't know. I really don't know the difference. I think you are it able feels better because. 
Yeah, and you are able to cut a bit deeper, I think. So maybe it's better for the club. I don't. I the, 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 I. To be honest, I don't think you can cut so deep that you actually come out on the other side of the record. <laughs> Even if, I don't think so. I don't think that's the. Um, I don't think. I don't know. I, I mean, is it just maybe it's just more durable? I don't know. Yeah, uh, it's just thicker. I don't know, but it feels it feels nicer. Yeah. Yeah. It feels yeah. Nicer. Apparently, Google it, says 180 gram vinyl records are stronger and more durable, so they tend to last longer and resist breakage. Right. It doesn't okay. say anything about fidelity. Nothing about sound. I don't. I don't think the sound will be different. I. I, I honestly don't think so. I think people. But, I think people have that belief that it sounds better too. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. People it's like the same. It's the same material and the same process. It's the same. That's what I think. It's exactly too, yeah. the same thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. We it's we use one hundred. We we use one hundred and eighty grams though. Um, so it's it's. Uh, but I think yeah, they just feel really long. nice in. Your, yeah, they just feel really nice in your hands. You know. Yeah. Yeah. And Does you it, can just tell people it sounds better too. <laughs> <laughs> is it more expensive to cut on the heavier vinyl on the one eighty gram? Um, yeah, well, the blanks are a little bit more expensive to buy. The only thing that that you don't get as much with uh, with 180 grams blank vinyls is that they warp. Uh, they warp. They tend to warp less. And uh, warping during, if you have a warped vinyl, blank vinyl, uh, it's impossible to get a good cut because it's just um, you know jittering or what is it called? Um, uh, fluttering all the time. No. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, so you have warps. Warps. Uh, you know, it's it can w be okay if you if you play back a warped record, you, you shouldn't hear too much of it. Mm -hmm. But if you cut it when it's warped, warped, you will hear it. You will actually hear some flutter going on no. uh, when you play it back. So yes, they 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 are um, less um, likely to warp. That's why we use the the heavier material. Right, right, okay. Well, so, so I have a question for you, Joachim. So kind of on the vinyl on the vinyl tip. Um, do you ever get asked to do like vinyl DJ sets? Um, yeah, I've done you one for one Boiler Room. Recently. For what? For Boiler Room. I've done one for Boiler Room. Oh, really? In, Lis oh. in, in Lisbon, this one? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I didn't know I that. saw you just do a live stream playing vinyl recently too, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, but that was just uh, playing AB, AB, you know, just oh, playing okay. store vinyl from the archive. Just basically a, oh. a mixtape type session, you know. Not, I didn't even mix in that in that session. But for, for the, the for the boiler room, I I cut the I cut four I did a four deck, uh, and effects uh, uh, set with uh, basically I just cut all my old tools you know like uh, one record with hi hat loops and one with with uh, percussion loops one with synth stuff one with kicks and loops and stuff, oh, wow. and uh, and I kind of did I did the same thing as I tend to do in Tractor you know just build stuff by combining loops different uh, you know frequencies and stuff. Um, so that was interesting, but the circumstances were terrible. <laughs> mm -hmm. There was all this dust coming from the ceiling, and they were like <laughs> going through the middle, you know, <laughs> because there was big balls of dust. And um, I did, I had a long sound check, and kind of, you know, had a confidence that it will all go well uh, when I finished the the sound check, because there was no resonance or anything going on. But when I came back, they, even though the the deal was to just leave my setup there, there was some thing with somebody missing flights and there was a live act you know just before and all my the decks were just in the booth <laughs> below with all these people so i had to set it up again really quickly um, um so it was a bit uh, handicapped in that sense but uh, yeah it was fun to do just made a yeah. bunch of stuff cut it to vinyl and then played it out it was, yeah, how, it was how cool. many vinyls did you cut for that um I had about fifty. I, I had a yeah i had about 15 records with okay. uh, two or multiple things on each each side so there were i don't know maybe 80 90 bits i could use for an hour yeah oh, which was lot. enough yeah yeah for sure i'm gonna yeah. look at it so the loud boxer record had had lock grooves on it too though right yeah well the final the final version was a was basically a, 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 lock, um, a lock groove record yeah with yeah. 200 in total yeah did you ever utilize that stuff live just playing those records uh, yeah, yeah, but not too much. I, I mean, I don't like to play my own records anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm Do busy. you? I don't actually. I don't play a lot of my own music in no, my sets. Me neither. Yeah. 
David can do a whole fucking like eight hour set. <laughs> David doesn't give a <laughs> shit. <He> did, yeah. <laughs> you know the funny thing is <laughs> closing I'll, night at Bergheim all truncate tracks the whole night. Fair enough. <laughs> I mean I I'll, I'll play my stuff, but I get tired of it so fast. Like mm. even before well before with gigs, I would like before the record came out, I would stop playing it once it was out because I was like I played it to death already. So no. Now it doesn't matter. There are no gigs now. <laughs> now you got to figure out doing how to do the live PA. <laughs> live PA to who? Well, to, you know, to living to people's living rooms. It's better than nothing. <laughs> yeah, I know. What about you, Marcus? Do you play? Do you like playing your own records, or do you? Most of the time, just the unreleased okay. stuff. Yeah. Uh, because, kind of, uh, when it's released, for me the process is done you know like for me then it's nothing special anymore you know i try to keep it special so i always just yeah if i play tracks it's most of the time unreleased stuff over my own then yeah cool but in the in the beginning i hated to play my uh, tracks because i i think i i didn't want to compare it uh with with the other stuff I like, you know. No. Maybe that's that's why, but yeah. Sometimes you find out how bad your mix is. Yeah. <laughs> you play yeah, it yeah. loud, you're like, whoa. And you're like, okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. The track before and the track after sounded a lot better than mine. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that happens so many times. That's it, you know. So I yeah. Mean, you, you, do, do you, you, David and um, and Marcus, do you judge? Um, the mixes of your stuff when you play it out i uh, i yeah yeah actually yeah. i do yeah because then i figure because it's hard i i try to mimic as much as i can how it's going to sound in a club and in, in my studio mm -hmm. but in the end it's like the the really bottom end and the highs yeah i almost always get wrong <laughs> yeah. which i'm sure a lot of people do yeah so the high end ends up being super like just too Deep. sharp but do you play that your unmastered versions or create yeah, mastered? Yeah. Okay. Or my own my own master basically. Right. Yeah. You know, it's my own master is like throwing a limiter on it and just making it a bit louder. And I'll roll off the lows and on the tops and the bottoms. Mm. That's about it. But a lot of times it's like, oh wow, it sounds really harsh in the top end. Yeah. I, I at least I can really tell. I'll play them too and give them feedback on their unreleased tracks as well. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think like you know if you're doing a live PA then all your tracks will sound somewhat the same in in yeah. your your style so then you start once you start DJing and playing music with other stuff that's been properly mastered and mixed and you're like oh wow this doesn't sound as good as I thought or it's missing this punch or the low end and yeah that's cool but don't you don't you get confused because um not every club system is a good representation of uh, you Very know, true. any uh, any other club system, basically. So it's it's like, how do you actually judge then? Well, it's just to yeah. to hear it in the context of other records. Is that what you mean? Yeah. So like, right. I know there's a record that's been mastered that I played before or after right. that I know sounds proper. So, okay, so you have like a benchmark. Tracks, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I'm like, wow, this track is not hitting as hard as I thought it would, or right. as well. So then I'm like, okay, I know what to. I have a idea in my head yeah sometimes you also have like stuff in the studio going on where like okay this is sounding super sick and then you play it out and it's just like trash like muddy like everything is yeah, yeah one big piece of shit you know and then you're like okay <laughs> one fuck I... piece of shit. <laughs> yeah <laughs> but then you yeah then you go back to the studio and try to fix it and then yeah, it's a process with some tracks. And it's, it's, it's a bit it's, weird. And it's hard to tell too because a lot of a lot of synth, um, sound systems will compress their their signal yeah. as well. So you're getting an extra compressed version of what your track is. Yeah. So yeah, you kind of just you know trial and error, I guess. Absolutely. But plus, my music is is mostly so stripped down anyway, where it just like once I control the low end and the high end. I really don't worry much about the mid range. Mm -hmm. mm. For for me, anyway. Okay, I think there's um, 
let's give uh, some more attention, pay some more attention to the people who are joining us because there's all these sub, sub discussions going on. Um, uh, sorry, people, that we didn't give you too much attention tonight. <laughs> Usually, we have more questions from the from the audience. Uh, I see. I see in, I saw in the chat. Yeah, I mean, this is connecting to what we're saying from Ken. What's up, Ken? What's up, Ken? Yo, um, hey. So before you um, you take it out to the club, do you compress and uh, limit your your tracks before you play it out, or I do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, not nothing crazy, but I like just to just to get the uh, the peaks under control and like yeah. just to give it a little bit of loudness. I'll throw a compressor and limiter. Yeah, on you it. you get just to gain some dBs, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Hmm. for the for the live set i don't uh but um yeah when i play it out in the clubs um as a dj same like david so you, you don't put a, a limiter compressor on your live pa nope oh okay didn't is figure that, out how <laughs> is that is that is that something people do regularly i thought i thought I don't, i've never done a live pa okay. so i thought that was a regular thing okay i didn't know i think uh don't know i think king has like a custom built small compressor if i'm right but i don't know yeah sure. i just checked it uh checked my live set in the studio um and it sounded nice and then i put it out in the club so Is i checked it I check the frequencies of each sound, and then if I think it's right, I just leave it. Yeah, I mean, in the end, in the end, I think most clubs anyway are having compressors and limiters on their yeah. si their system anyway, so it doesn't matter. Yeah. But what's the what's the club? What, is it stereo Mo that that doesn't have any? They have no processing on their sound system. I think was it that one? I don't know if it's stereo. In Montreal, doesn't doesn't really they use out. they use some uh, tube. Um, amps or something i mean there is there is some uh, saturation going on when, when you drive it uh, but there's no i don't know there there is I don't, I don't remember it clearly but there may be uh, people in the comments you know some people who've played there uh, know but i think there is there, when you there is there is a stage somewhere you can drive and and uh, um to get more uh, saturation or something i don't know that's what i remember anyway yeah i think i think i remember them telling me like you, you know you can see the meters uh, from the booth at and stereo and they're like if it's hitting the red it's it's distorting right because there's no there's no limiter on it so yeah. i can imagine someone who's doing a live pa there is probably driving them <laughs> crazy yeah <laughs> well i mean I if, you, if you if you if you're an experienced um right right musician or or producer who's playing a live show the, the it basically especially with live shows everything is about level isn't it mm -hmm. um when mixing down your stuff um uh, yeah um, I think if you have a safe gain structure and um, make sure there's nothing you can touch to completely, you know, blow, blow some up. blow stuff up. Yeah, that if you keep everything in a on, on a on a, in a sort of safe system. Yeah. Uh, and you um, then then you should be fine, I guess. And and um, I saw this thing uh, from Fred Fred Janelli here. I kind of agree with this, you know. Uh, he doesn't use any compressors limiters for live PAs because it sounds better than records usually, and I I, I kind of agree. So if if you have a well mixed down uh, set of uh, of hardware, it completely blows out uh, and blows away any uh, CDJ sound or or yeah. right. you know yeah. um, vinyl. Because you're you getting know, like you get a raw a raw like drum machine. Mix. Yeah, a raw drum machine on a PA is just it's just mad, you know yeah it can sound so punchy so um, massive and alive you know because the sound is not contained so every uh, tiny level change you do like you know if you like the way you open up sounds on the on the actual 808 or 909 or tr8s or whatever you know you have a manual control over the levels you know yeah. that usually that brings brings in a lot of uh, extra um liveliness because in the studio if something like that happens you edit it out or you control it in a, in a in a certain way but just people you know fucking throwing things in and cutting things out live is is sounding way more exciting i think yeah um, when you when you were using a 909 live did you ever 
process it at all or is it just no all stereo st stereo I, well yeah i mean i've i've started doing public energy shows like like 150 banging you know acid stuff and uh i use the o oto machines boom you know b-o-u-m oh, yeah. it's a compressor warmer saturated distortion type thing okay. and i just run the whole thing through it like stereo out and um and it sounds incredible it just sucks everything you know it's it is a very interesting work um result on the dynamics of the of the machine it makes weird tails on sounds and um oh. still sounds punchy it sounds really punchy um doesn't hurt your ears does look not one of these nasty sounding distortions it sounds very warm and um uh, dynamic yeah I'll tell boom I had, I had to look it up cuz I don't know what that machine is but oh, oh they 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 do a little box uh, yeah they do uh, there's a range of three. I think there's a, a reverb, a delay, and a and a compressor slash. Uh, is it, is that like comparable to like the analog heat or something? But maybe yeah, better? yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind yeah, of the same. and I, I think the analog heat is um, uh, yeah, it's it's you could compare it, but I think the boom has a bit more character. It's okay. a bit more. Okay. Um, is this uh, probably the same company vibey. that makes the 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 biscuit? O O T O yeah 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 yeah, yeah. auto right auto. OTO or auto? Yeah. It looks like the biscuit uh company. Yeah, I never seen that. Looks cool. Live and learn. Anyway, we were past the two hour mark, people. I don't want to uh to keep you from your uh, daily uh, <laughs> uh routines and I stuff. Have, have I mean I, I'm happy to continue uh, talking. <laughs> I'm I'm happy to continue talking with you guys. Um I mean I'm having a great time, but um you know, two hours plus already. Yeah, sure. Is there anything next, you wanna you wanna next, next time three in? hours? <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Yeah, uh, anything you wanna plug, like stuff you're working on, or um, sh I'm sure it's uh, not gonna be you're plugging any gigs, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess the only thing I would have to say is if if you guys are not uh, following my Bandcamp page, maybe if you want to check out this new Hypoxia record, I'll be dropping it in the next two to three weeks. I think it'll it'll go live. So, nice. And for anybody who's on the Discord thing, I'm gonna post a link to the new Belief Defect tracks we just finished as well. Yeah, I have, uh, I have a record coming out on my label. The remixes from Josh Wink, Radio Slave, Lauren Flax, and I did a remix contest a few months ago. And yeah, how did that go? That was great, man. So this, the winner of that contest is on this record now. And awesome. it's uh, Kai, Kai Van Dongen. He's uh, from South Africa, but he's living in London now. Cool. And yeah, yeah, the remix contest was awesome. I got, I got over 600 submissions. It was crazy. Whoa, that's crazy. Did you, yeah. you, you listen to them all? Of course. Yeah. Every morning I would wake up and go through the emails for that day and listen to them and sort them out. And then I was just doing that every day instead of waiting to the. I'm glad I didn't wait to the end because it would have taken forever. Yeah, that's why you. That's why you Amazing. didn't make any new music then. Yeah, <laughs> so, well, a, a little bit of that, but most of it just because I just wasn't inspired. But yeah, yeah. I mean, in, in the end, I, I picked the one winner that's going on the on this record that's just coming out, and then I also did a, a compilation of 14 other other winners, and I released that one digitally, which is all on Bandcamp, and yeah, you can look for me on Bandcamp and. That remix, the new one that's coming out, will be up there uh, pretty soon as well. So, awesome. Yeah. Okay. Sounds like a fun project. Yeah. Yeah, it was fun. And you, Marcus, you. Um, uh, there you was. Said, yeah. <laughs> hmm? No, yeah, yeah. You said uh, you haven't you haven't done anything in a month, but do you have anything coming out or? Uh, actually, yesterday there was a release on Split EP together with Andre Cronard. Uh, oh, nice. on on tech support um yeah and then there's one release schedule but i don't have the uh, date in mind um which is uh on a cologne based label yeah but yeah will be out uh, during this year and uh own labels i don't have any any pressure to put out new music there so maybe next year end of this year let's see so yeah very cool cool stuff yeah and i i try to work on on new 
concepts and ideas. So let's see. Nice one. Looking forward to uh, to the, your new stuff. Um, Actually, I can send you some unreleased stuff. So yeah. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. I would we'll love to. So. Thanks, man. <laughs> well, thanks for having us back on the show, man. I, yeah, oh, yeah. Thanks for, thanks, for, here. thanks for being here, man. I really enjoyed the conversation. For yeah, sure. it's an honor. Yeah. Good to see you, man. It's been it's been a couple of years. I haven't seen you, so yeah. Nice. In yeah, yeah, definitely great to catch up. Yeah, good to see yeah, you, man. man. Sure. Um, I have to do another little uh, housekeeping shout out. Um, we have. Um, started a discord server a while ago um the link should be in the description of the video um if people want to continue hanging out with uh, me and i think mo is going to be around maybe david and marcus yeah. i will do uh, i will do so next week because okay. i still need to fix out how to run it on my yeah sure man computer. it's 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 online or it's online uh, permanently so it's just uh, yeah. when, after these chats people tend to drop in by uh, larger numbers but it's always there, so yeah, just drop in when whenever you feel like you figured we'll it out. We'll do so. Yeah, I'll jump on the um, Discord after this is done. If anybody has any more questions or anything, I'll be hanging out in there for a while. Cool. cool. Excellent. All right, so maybe see you all there. All right, guys. And uh, sure. thanks again for uh, hanging out, um, and um, have a great week. You yeah, too. you too. Stay safe. You too. Ciao, ciao. Bye.